Uh, my name is Kelsey Hardigan, and I am the Deputy Director of the Project on Nuclear Issues and a Senior Fellow with the International Security Program uh, here at CSIS. Uh, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce our next panel on the Nuclear Posture Review uh, Process and Policy Decisions. After a really great discussion this morning on integrated deterrence and the evolving interplay between conventional and nuclear deterrence, uh, I think we're going to turn now to a really interesting discussion on uh, the process behind how we set nuclear strategy and force requirements and um, the, the, the changes of that process over time. So there have now been five NPRs conducted to date. Uh, we're lucky to have a great lineup of speakers with us today uh, who collectively have been in, involved in all five of those NPRs. Uh, so online, we have Elaine Bunn. Uh, Elaine is a senior non-resident advisor uh, with a project on nuclear issues here at CSIS uh, and has 40 years of experience uh, working on defense policy issues. She was previously the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy and was previously involved in the 1994, 2001, and 2010 NPRs. Uh, to my right here on the stage, we have Dr. Rob Sufer. Uh, Rob is an adjunct associate professor at Georgetown University and a non-resident senior associate with the Missile Defense Project here at CSIS. Uh, Rob was also um, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy previously and was the co-director of the 2018 NPR and Missile Defense Review. And finally, also online, we have Greg Weaver. Uh, Greg retired from U.S. government service uh, recently and most recently served as the Deputy Director for Strategic Stability for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Directorate for the Strategy and Plans, the, the J-5. Uh, Greg was heavily involved in the last two NPRs and has been uh, involved in, in a number of these discussions over the years through various positions with the Joint Staff, the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy, and U.S. Strategic Command. So to get us started, uh, I'll turn it over to Elaine to talk a bit about uh, the purpose of NPRs, how NPRs uh, are drafted, and, and how, again, how those processes have changed over time. So Elaine, over to you. Thanks, Kelsey, and good afternoon to those of you in the room, and good morning from the Pacific Northwest, where, because it's been almost 90 several days, they think they're in the heat wave. Elaine, I'm, I'm going to pause you for just a second. We're, we're having a comms uh, issue in, in the room, so we just need to get the audio turned up. All right, let's 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 try it again. <laughs> Elaine, over to you, take two. <laughs> you didn't miss much. I just was saying good afternoon and good morning from the Pacific Northwest where, because it's been uh, almost 90 for several days in a row, they think we're in a heat wave and those of us DC natives scoff at them. Uh, <laughs> I will, I'm, as uh, Kelsey said, I'm going to focus on the first three questions posed to our panel, purpose, uh, process, how it's changed over time, what does that mean for future reviews, and the third one about how NPRs impact the deterrence landscape. So I'll try to cover those and leave 2018 and 2022 mostly to Rob and Greg. Uh, so, so for almost 30 years now, uh, each new presidential administration has conducted a nuclear post review early in its tenure. And they look at the strategic environment, they assess the state, the current state of nuclear weapons and policy, and, and they put their own spin on what they think are the important objectives related to nuclear weapons. I, I do agree with the previous panel that these reviews are a way that administrations try to differentiate themselves from the previous ones. So sometimes you get uh, changes in language that may not have as much substantive difference. Um, I've been involved in some way or another in all five NPRs, three of them under Democratic administrations, two under Republican ones. And I'm here to warn Rob and Greg and any of you who have been or want to be involved in an NPR that once you get that NPR stuff on your shoe, it's really hard. <laughs> uh, it started for me in 90, 1994, was executive director of the first named NPR. Uh, there had been nuclear reviews, of course, under that, but mostly classified and not called that. And that was under, the 94 one was under then Assistant Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, and it truly was my year from hell, uh, professionally. And not, not because of Ash Carter, maybe part of it, but not because of that, but it just was a very intense, any of you who've been involved understand what an intense process it is. 
uh, 2001, um, I spent four months on loan from National Defense University to the Pentagon to help frame that NPR. 2010, I was again seconded to the Pentagon for two months to help frame strategy for that NPR. Uh, 2018 and 2022 NPRs, even after you retire from government, I've learned that sometimes you get asked for advice by some of the inside participants or invited to give talks on the NPR conferences and workshops. So that means I've looked at NPRs from both sides now, from in and out, and still somehow da da da. You know, none of the NPRs was the same as any other. That's what I've learned. Each is different in how it's conducted, uh, coordinated, what the threat environment is at the time, what results are. There's a lot, admittedly, there's a lot of substantive continuity, but each one reflects the tweaks of the then current administration. Um, there are some commonalities in the process and in issues they, they have to struggle with. Um, all have started with, I'd say, similar methodology. That is, threat assessment. What the, what's the world look like now? What ro what's the role of nuclear weapons in our defense strategy? And from there, what do we need to do and what do we need to say? Um, so how did the past NPRs hold up in terms of their threat analysis, the roles of nuclear weapons, and the assessment of what's needed? Did they weather well over the next four to eight years of that administration? Well, so in 1994, uh, it was the end of the Cold War, uh, really a lot of focus on getting nuclear weapons out of Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, uh, lead the way to further reductions, but hedge against geopolitical or technical surprises, work toward a more democratic Russia, but prepare for one that be could become more autocratic or break up further. I mean, there were really three paths that we were looking at. So <laughs> we, it didn't go the way we wanted it to, but we at least we did think about the more autocratic one. Um, 2001, uh, that one, to that Russia, Russia is not our enemy. China's still a secondary case, but the size of the nuclear force will be X times bigger, so China won't be tempted to sprint to parity. <laughs> North Korea had not yet tested nukes. Um, that NPR in 2001 was capabilities-based, whatever that means, and not threat-based. And then, of course, 9-11 occurred, and the entire focus of the Defense Department and USG changed. Um, 2010, nuclear terrorism and proliferation were the highest concerns. Uh, including North Korea, which had started nuclear tests in 2006. Uh, reset and a new START treaty with Russia were high on the agenda. Strategic stability with, Russia, with China, uh, reducing the role of nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, the, the fundamental role is to deter nuclear attacks, but there's still some roles in non-nuclear aggression. Um, that was, you know, the Obama uh, work towards a world without nuclear weapons, but as long as they exist, we're going to have safe, secure, effective nuclear arsenal. And it set out the, the baseline modernization plan that's still going on. But, but I will remind you that the tone of the Obama administration changed from that 2010 NPR uh, after the 2014 uh, Russia inv Russian invasion of Ukraine and annexation of Crimea. So that then led into the 2018 that Rob will talk about more. But, but in essence, Russia and China were seen as the main threats. But you also had to continue, uh, continue to worry about North Korea and its continued testing of nukes and, and Iran. Um, there were new, the new nuclear supplements, the 76-2 and the Slickham N, to the Obama nuclear modernization plan. It elaborated declaratory policy to suggest the possibility of nuclear response to non-strategic um, non-nuclear strategic threats, though you could argue that had been implicit, not explicit in previous administrations. And then the 2022 NPR, we know a little that has come out publicly. Again, China-Russia focus, kind of in reverse order. Um, it did not adopt sole purpose, canceled the slick amend, and continued the lower yield 76-2 SLBM warhead. So a quick look at the past makes me dubious that this NPR will be the answer for all times about the threat, about the role of nuclear weapons or what we need to have and do. Uh, a lot of these issues have a way of coming back. 
uh, maybe not in quite the same form, but, but never being settled really, uh, perhaps they can't be. Um, you know, the answers are bound to evolve and change, even though their importance makes it seem like it should be, they should be absolute and final answers because of the importance of nuclear weapons, to paraphrase Paul Hammond. Um, so some NPRs are congressionally mandated and some aren't. For example, the first one in 94 was not, it was self-initiated. Uh, but the 2001 and 2010 NPRs were required by Congress. The NPR process, um, all five have been led by OSD with varying degrees of interagency and allied involvement during the process. 94, the first soup to nuts nuclear review where Department of Defense, SecDef Les Aspen's attitude was let a thousand flowers bloom. The NPR was inclusive to a fault within DOD. You know, if you thought you might have a stake, then come on in. Uh, there were six working groups, and I'll just say they were threatened strategy, forces, operations, NC3, counterproliferation, and arms control. And I enumerate them because basically those same themes are addressed in most NPRs. Um, but each of those six working groups uh, had 50 or so people, and that's like at the working level. Oh my God, it was quite a process. You can see why it was my year from hell. Uh, but as far as interagency participants, the IC was the only non-DOD participant during the study. DOE and state were briefed uh, near the end. And on allies, I recall only one NATO high-level group consultation, uh, and that was because Hmm. The then Deputy Secretary couldn't understand why we still had nuclear weapons in Europe um, after the end of the Cold War. Um, that changed somewhat, uh, it changed a lot actually with the 2001 uh, nuclear post review. That one was very exclusive. It was a small, I would even say insular group. Um, Secretary uh, Rumsfeld and DSD Wolfowitz and Special Assistant Steve Cambone did that with the other reviews, the other, and there were 18 in all reviews when they came in. Um, and the Lennel owner and I, who spent the first four months on it, were told to keep it very small, very unlike the hundreds of whoever's interested in the first NPR. Um, but we, we did insist that we couldn't do it without OSD, Joint Staff, and STRATCOM. Uh, I think our group on the NPR was the only one of the um, of the reviews uh, that brought in others inside DOD. The other 17 did not. Uh, NNSA was brought in for SecDef briefs on weapons and infrastructure issues, but not so much apart. 2010 and 2018 were somewhere between those two extreme streams of 94 and 2001. I, I understand they were they were pretty inclusive, much more so than 2001. Um, but less so than in terms of 99 and letting anybody in DOD who, was, who wanted to participate. Uh, there was much more allied consultation and in 2022, it seems to have included interagencies and allies all during the process, but I'll let others speak to that. Now being inclusive uh, in an NPR has pros and cons. Um, the pros are you get the, all the relevant information and considerations Everybody feels heard. You can um, bring everyone along in the process so they understand the eventual decisions, even if they don't necessarily agree with them. Uh, you have a common sheet of music when it comes to uh, congressional and international interactions. The cons are it takes a lot of time and energy to be that, that inclusive. Um, there's also more concern about leaks with more people involved. Although in my experience, uh, it's usually the higher ups who talk with the media, not the lower level people. Um, and it, it takes a long time to get to agreement, uh, partly because even after lower levels hash out issues, the upper, upper levels often have to hash it out all over again. Uh, and the more people involved, the more, the more agencies and allies and so forth involved, the, the longer that takes. But you know, in the end, all of them have taken about a year, give or take a few months. And I can certainly say that all have taken longer than was first anticipated in each administration. Um, but even when the NPR is completed, 
the implementer, which has been classified so far in all of them, takes more time, usually a year or more. And many battles get refought in the guise of implementation. But it's a really important step because whatever the policy content is in the NPR, it means nothing without implementation. The process of putting those decisions into effect and that really does require oversight and follow up and some way of tracking what's being done. It's, it's probably a bigger job than doing, doing NPRs. There's also constantly been this issue of classified or unclassified report. Um, generally, the trend has been toward more and more unclassified explanation up until this year, at least uh, for now. Uh, uh, we anticipate more unclassified explanation. The first two were classified and really not released in totality. Only the top level decisions were communicated to the public and to most of Congress. Uh, 20, uh, literally, uh, it was just a briefing on the, on the first NPR and some words, some pages in the SecDef annual report. The second NPR in 2001 was, had selective leaks, but there was never an unclassified um, rollout. 2010 was born unclassified, it was only an unclassified report. 2018 and, and was born classified, but much was declassified in a glossy report. In both of those, the 2010 and the 2018 had big rollouts for public release. I guess 2022 has had the worst of both worlds <laughs> seems to have been conducted classified with a half page public release just as the classified version was going to congress and and still no unclassified version um yeah poses problems for those of us in conferences but also maybe for uh messages so who's the audience uh usually there are lots of them um dod itself to keep everyone aligned on what they say and do the interagency, Congress, same reasons, international allies and adversaries, and usually it's those latter two audiences who are the ones who read it most closely, much more closely than anybody in the USG. Um, and we, we really do send, I think, deterrence and assurance messages big time in a public NPR report. There's some other trends uh, from 94 to 2022. Generally, more and more interagency input input during the process, uh, progressively more consultation with allies, uh, progressively over time, more integrated with, with other capabilities. Um, example, 94 bottom-up review was done on conventional forces, then the NPR started, it was just on NPR. 2001, you, you got the new triad of strike, conventional nuclear and non-nuclear, missile defenses and C3 ISR all, all glued together with infrastructure. 2010, you got the tailored architectures for, for the regions, including nuclear conventional missile defense. 2018 added to those more focus on cyber and space. And then in 2022, you get integrated deterrence as discussed in, in the first panel. Uh, most have addressed arms control in some way, certainly the first three um, 94 was the basis of the start to uh, negotiations, never came into force because the Duma never ratified, but, but it was the basis of, for the force structure for that. Um, 2001 was the foundation of the Moscow Treaty, and of course the 2010 was the foundation uh, for the New START um, negotiations uh, and the treaty that, that resulted there. Um, should future U.S. administrations conduct NPRs, and if so, how can this process be improved? I think we have to learn from the past, keep the good stuff, ditch the bad stuff. Um, what do I think is the good stuff and the bad stuff? If you're not going to have an unclassified report, don't bother announcing that you're doing an NPR. It just muddies the waters, and if you're not going to put it out there, then don't, don't, don't say you're going to do one. Uh, I think including the U.S. interagency opens the aperture on what's important and is worth the trouble. Uh, and I also think that there's no such thing as too much consultation with allies during the process and after, uh, after as well. And I also think nesting it in the broader context uh, is a good thing. Um, since, since I wrote 
I've consistently written since about 2001 that uh, we should be doing strategic posture reviews. Uh, I wrote in 2001 it should include both nuclear and missile defense. Uh, that is, you know, broader strategery, I guess you would say. Uh, I think you at least have to nest the nuclear review in an overarching strategy. I think that's something that this administration got right and it should continue because nuclear weapons may be unique, but they don't exist in a vacuum. Then the question of what impact do changes in the NPR have on the deterrence landscape? Um, I'd say less than you might think. <laughs> They're, I see them as an indication of the strategic landscape and deterrence thinking at the time rather than the driver. We all know that uh, theoretically nuclear force requirements flow from presidential guidance, uh, interpreted in more detailed SECDEF guidance, to even more detailed uh, joint JCS guidance. Um, and as a number of STRATCOM commanders have said, the forces I need depend on what you want me to be able to do. So give me the guidance and I'll tell you what I need. But in actuality, <laughs> the, the first three NPRs were conducted based on the previous president's guidance. Um, the Clinton NPR was based on Reagan, actually one was removed, uh, the Reagan nuclear employment guidance. The George W. Bush NPR was based on Clinton's 97, 97 guidance. And the Obama NPR was based on George W. Bush guidance, presidential guidance. Um, and that's because the NPRs are done early in the administration and the presidential nuclear employment guidance tends to lag by two to four years. Um, but, but once you've done that assessment, um, that's not the end of it. It's only partly what determines the forces and plans you end up with. Don't think for a second that you get to start with a clean sheet of paper. Um, obviously, there's what's happening in the world, outside views, views of your administration, allies, Congress, so forth. They put real limits on what can be changed. Uh, yeah, you try to look out five to 10 years, make decisions that affect the forces you have for the next 20 or more years, but you're not gonna change it too much because they're legacy systems, you know, the tyranny of the baseline and much of what you decide in an NPR won't come to fruition in your presidential term. So I guess I would, my bottom line is that NPRs are useful, but not determinative. With that, look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks. Great, thanks, Elaine. No, I think I think that's a really great um, scene setter and overview to kind of again put put it in the context. Um, so we're gonna hit the fast forward button, so to speak, uh, and and go to to 2018 um, from from Elaine's remarks, uh, and and Rob will kind of walk us through what that process looked like behind the scenes um, and some and some of the the trade offs associated with that. So Rob, over to you. Thank you, uh, Elaine. Excellent presentation. I think uh, I think that, that that covers much of what uh, Greg and I were also going to say. But let me uh, focus on a couple of the questions that you um, you asked us uh, to deal with. And one is the interagency process and how important that was and how we conducted it. You know, there's uh, there's a tendency for people uh, not familiar with government looking inside, you know, from the outside. That, that we're a big black box, you know, and whatever whatever comes out of a, of an organization is, uh, you know, represents the views of everybody in in the in the department, uh, and there isn't a lot of uh, uh, pushing and pulling that goes on, which is of course not true, right? And so the interagency process is important for coordinating the uh, uh, various policies, and there's no rule or rhyme to interagency coordination, right? There's, there, it's really up to the president and the national security advisor and, in fact, how the, uh, the, the cabinet uh, officials determine that they're going to conduct coordination. There's a story about um, uh, Jim Schlesinger, the Secretary of Defense, who essentially announced uh, uh, the, uh, the Nixon nuclear policy, the uh, uh, and NISDM 242, the limited flexible nuclear options, he announced it uh, in, a, in a briefing uh, to reporters, uh, which made Henry Kissinger, who's a national security advisor, very very upset at the time because they were they were still negotiating uh, the language. Uh, um, Senator Muskie, uh, who was then Secretary of State Muskie, was taken by surprise by the announcement of Presidential Decision 59. That was the uh, the Carter administration uh, uh, nuclear guidance. Uh, not much involvement from the State Department. So you would assume. 
assume that there would be coordination, and you would assume that it would, it would make sense to coordinate with your colleagues, but it's not always the case, right? There was a, a, a great quote by Senator Arthur Vandenberg who says, look, if you want me in on the landing, I gotta be in on the takeoff. Right? And that's uh, our approach uh, to, to coordination uh, during the, uh, the Trump administration. Our approach was very inclusive. As Elaine pointed out, you can have a few people do the review and then farm it out for coordination, or you can at the very outset include everybody. Right? So we, we chose the latter approach, and that was uh, the approach that uh, Secretary Mattis favored. Uh, and part of his strategy was not only to build consensus, but to raise the nuclear IQ. He felt that uh, you know, we were just recovering from a, from a long nuclear holiday at the end of the Cold War, and he wanted to make sure people understood uh, uh, the role for nuclear weapons and, and, and our strategy. And uh, interestingly enough, we, uh, from the outset, we included the Joint Staff, and Greg Weaver was my co-lead at the working group level. We included the Joint Staff at, at the outset. It was a co-lead. It was not an Office of Secretary of Defense lead with the Joint Staff. It was literally uh, co-led by the Joint Staff, and it included virtually any organization in the Department of Defense that wanted to be involved in this, uh, as well as the Department of Energy, the Office of Management and Budget, the National Security Council, uh, the intelligence community, and we even had the Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, from the White House. So again, the purpose was to be inclusive and to get all, uh, all the views held. And we had a, um, a process by which we uh, de developed the work and then we, we coordinated we, uh, each, each segment of the work, so you didn't wait till the end. So for instance, you would do a segment on the threat, and you would have uh, the intelligence community brief the threat, and we tried to come to, to an agreement at the working group level, which was led by, by Greg and I, as I said, at the three-star level. These are mostly two-star two and below participants. Uh, we, would, we would get an agreement on, on how to characterize the threat, you know, great power competition as opposed to, say, the big threat coming from uh, 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 nuclear proliferation. Then we would take that to the um, uh, three-star uh, work uh, senior steering group, which was chaired by a four-star. And so you had senior level uh, assistant secretaries, uh, three-star admirals uh, uh, adjudicating the recommendations of the working group, right? Once that was done, we took it to the deputy secretary of defense, and the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs to get their imprimatur on it. Then that would be taken to the White House for a deputies committee meeting, where you've got uh, all the other cabinets uh, represented, including the United Nations, Treasury was there, everybody. So you do the threat section, then what are the roles for nuclear weapons? You get all that approved, you take it, you take it up to the White House. By the time the, uh, the final document was, was, was being submitted to the interagency, to the cabinet by, by Secretary Mattis. Everybody knew what was in it, right? And so that was, that was a big deal. And it really helped um, uh, gain support for the document, and it helped, I would say, in implementation afterwards, right? So, uh, so, th so that was good. And, and then um, to help uh, grease the, the consensus building, uh, and probably the interagency process, Secretary Mattis also created uh, a group of independent advisors, sometimes referred to as the gray beards. And it had a wide range of views. Mattis believed in what he called a skilled dialectic, right, having all sides. So you had Rose Gott Miller on one side, uh, you had uh, you know, Frank Miller on the other, and you had some retired uh, SAC commanders and STRATCOM commanders uh, p providing uh, advice. And again, the working group would, would brief the results of each of these particular segments of the review. They would comment on it and provide their feedback to the Secretary of Defense. And it was another opportunity for the Secretary to meet with his senior uh, officials and to discuss the various parts of the review. So again, there were no surprises going forward. And I, I have to say that I, I'm not familiar, of course, with the Obama review, but I do know from, from observing it from the outside, there was this uh, tension between the disarmers, uh, mostly in the White House, I think, and what I called a deterrence realist in the Pentagon. Uh, that clash made, made the coordination very difficult or more difficult. We did not experience that, quite frankly, because, again, we had a more homogeneous view uh, about what the threat was and about what the role of nuclear weapons were. So for us, the coordination process was, um, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it difficult. It was, it just, it was just time consuming, but at the end of the day, pro probably served us uh, very well. The, um, the, uh, the, the big drawback of the, um, 
of the process that I just outlined is that it naturally detracts from doing deep dives on uh, potentially um, more controversial things, you know, uh, black swan events. You know, one of the criticisms of the 9-11 uh, the uh, uh, attack as well as Pearl Harbor was, uh, according to the reviews that were done, a failure of a lack of imagination to imagine things that could happen. And when you're doing everything that Elaine just explained and what I explained, you know, do you need a triad? Why, why do you need a triad? What are the roles for nuclear weapons? You know, what are the different types of nuclear strategies? Uh, and, and then what are, what are the nuclear force postures? You don't have time to do these important deep dives. Oh my God, you spent all this time debating over no first use and sole use. Maybe there are some more important questions that you should be <laughs> spending your time on. And the problem is there's only so much oxygen in the, in the policy space. And when the, uh, the, the, the senior decision makers are, are, are debating no first use, uh, they're not debating uh, p potentially the, uh, the expansion of China and what this means in a, in a you know, uh, two nuclear peer context. The, these are the big issues that I just don't think they, the current administration had time to reflect upon. And I know there were, there were things that we weren't able to, to reflect upon as well. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, we, um, in thinking about our nuclear force posture, uh, you know in the past we've contemplated uh, making a portion of our ICBM force mobile to improve the survivability. And for, for various technical and political reasons during the Cold War, uh, we uh, decided not to, to, to adopt that. Uh, I think uh, it, it probably would have been a good idea if we could have spent more time in our review to, to contemplate what that meant. But that would have required, again, a very significant effort. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, I was reading the tea leaves and I knew the Air Force was not interested in spending uh, any additional money on the GBSD. It was already quite, quite costly. There were political problems associated with it so that in order to, to move this process forward and get it done in a timely manner in a way that would build consensus, um, I uh, regrettably uh, allow that to, to slide. And, and, and there are other things that we probably would have done if we didn't have to spend all this time. So for instance, if you look at the result of the Trump nuclear post review, I know this is not the, the impression you get from reading the press reports, but there's very little difference between Trump and, Trump and Obama. You know, there's a nuclear sea launch cruise missile, there's a low yield summary launch ballistic missile, some rhetorical phrases having to do with, with arms control. But at the end of the day, there's a probably 90% similarity. If we had just banged the table and taken that 90% from Obama, done that in, say, two months, we could have then devoted six or seven months towards looking at some of these other issues. The problem is you can't do that because of politics, right? You're all, you have different points of view that need to be aired. And uh, it was, there was no way that the, uh, uh, the Biden administration could not spend time on the no first use issue, even though at the end of the day, they've got basically the same result as Obama and Trump. But they, 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 they uh, I don't want to say waste the time, but they could have, they could have used that time probably to, to look at some other issues, particularly with respect to reducing nuclear risks. Uh, and maybe there is some, some of that in the nuclear posture review. I'm, I'm sure there is, but they probably could have spent some more time. So that, I think, is my, my biggest regret uh, that, that, that came out of uh, the, the interagency process. Um, and uh, at the risk of, of repeating something that uh, Elaine said, I'm not sure that we need to have these high visibility nuclear posture reviews. Back in the old day, I'm referring to the Cold War, every administration, of course, would review nuclear policy. And the results of that would appear in a chapter in the annual report to Congress that the Department of Defense would provide to, uh, uh, to, to, to the House and the Senate. Right? This, this might be a 10-page summary of what our nuclear policy is, as elaborated by congressional testimony. Right? That's all you really need. And somehow we got involved in these uh, 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 expansive efforts that led to, uh, to glossy documents uh, with lots of pictures. Uh, and uh, creates a, a, a lot of expectations and a, a lot of opportunity for, for mischief in the, uh, in the blogosphere and in the press. So uh, if I had my way, I would go back to the old format, uh, a very uh, modest uh, uh, document, uh, again, uh, uh, amplified by congressional testimony and congressional budget documents. And I'll end there. Thank you.
Great, thanks, Rob. No, I, th I think that's a, it's a really helpful perspective, and I think we'll we'll turn it over to um, to Greg now. And again, Greg can can talk about um, both the 2018 piece as well to, to amplify what Rob has said. And then he is in the very unenviable position of uh, of talking around uh, 2022 and, and sharing what he can there as well. So, um, Greg, over to you. Thanks a lot, Kelsey. And uh, you know, like you. So Rob observed um, Elaine's overview of sort of the history of this entire process was really comprehensive and really helpful. And Rob, I didn't really disagree with anything Rob said, um, except maybe about not doing these. I've got to think about that a little bit. I've never, I've never had the option of not doing one, so I have to think now about whether that's a good option to have or not. Um, but so what I am going to do then is. Um, Kind of focus i will do what kelsey asked but i want to kind of focus on a couple of the most important things in my experience about nprs that are kind of lessons learned for if we do choose to do these again in the future and i suspect we will uh, partly for political reasons as elaine said um, so let me focus on that and let me start by saying that um, i think it's highly unlikely it, if we do future nprs uh, that they won't be, they won't continue the trend Elaine identified of very extensive allied consultation and uh, a broader interagency involvement in the reviews. And I think that's true for a couple of reasons. Um, as far as allied consultation, um, it's a must. There are, in the security environment we're in and heading into, uh, where, you know, the way the Trump administration would have said in great power competition is returned and, and the way I would say it is we face a future of two nuclear peers uh, for the first time in the nuclear age. Um, in that environment, there's a lot of concerns among allies about the credibility of extended deterrence and, uh, and the role of an extended American extended nuclear deterrence in the alliances in both Asia and, and Europe. Um, is so central that any kind of an NPR would have to include heavy consultation with the allies or they would be beating the door down. <laughs> um, and, and if we said, hey, we'll tell you about this when we're done, um, it would really cause assurance issues within the alliances in, in both theaters. Um, so I think that's a that's a must. Uh, the other one that I think is a must that uh, I'll emphasize is given the state of the DOE uh, nuclear weapons complex, it's almost impossible now to do a meaningful nuclear posture review that includes a look at capabilities and modernization without DOE in the room because you don't know what your constraints are. <laughs> um, so you have to, I mean, you don't want to be recommending things that are undoable, uh, that you can't implement. Uh, and so you really have to have DOE in the room uh, in order to do that. Um, and then state needs to be there uh, because both of the potential impact on alliances, but also on the potential impact of relations with the adversaries uh, and, and, and given state's role in arms control, obviously, they, they really need to be there. Um, so I expect that trend will continue and, and needs to continue. Um, what I think is, I may be one of the only people that thinks this, but I actually think that um, the methodology chosen for how to attack the problems in the NPR is actually really important to getting a good outcome. Um, so I was not directly involved in the 2010 NPR in the Pentagon because I was at Strategic Command, but I was indirectly involved because of STRATCOM's role in that NPR. Uh, and then I was obviously fairly heavily involved in both 2018, and I can't decide whether to call it 21 or 22. Uh, but um, I think that in my experience, the methodology that was used in the 2018 NPR was really helpful to getting a, a really good outcome. Uh, and that basically consisted of four steps, Then they've been touched on, Lillian touched on this a little, but I wanna go into a little more detail on this because I think it is important. We started, that NPR started with a threat deep dive that took about two months of really going hard into the intelligence on 
um, not just what potential adversaries are doing in the nuclear realm, but what the whole threat space looks like, because nuclear weapons play a broader role than simply countering nuclear weapons, though that's their most fundamental role. Um, and that deep dive didn't just look at capabilities, but dug pretty deeply into strategy and doctrine and intent and leadership views. Um, and that was important later on in that review because that review ultimately concluded that the only area of U.S. nuclear sort of strategy uh, and policy that needed to be addressed with some change in capability declaratory policy was the threat of Russian limited nuclear use to either coerce uh, capitulation uh, on their terms or to defeat conventional NATO forces, or NATO conventional forces in, in a conflict using non-strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, and that really, that focus really resulted from that deep dive. Um, the role of nuclear weapon, we then looked at the role of nuclear weapons in U.S. national security strategy. So we said, okay, if this is the threat environment, what roles do nuclear weapons play in our national security strategy? Uh, and as Rob said, we took each one of these steps, we took this up through the system all the way to the deputy secretary and the, and the vice chairman inside the Pentagon and then to deputies committees across the river. Um, and those decisions that were made at those levels enabled us, gave us decisions on what the roles were. So then we could do the next step, which was what should our strategy be for fulfilling those roles? And without a decision on what the roles are, first, how do you develop strategy uh, to address the roles that, that you've decided on? Um, and so that doing this in a rigorous fashion and working your way through those steps really, uh, I think, helps deliver a better product. And I'll explain a little more about why in a minute. Uh, and then the, only after looking at threat, roles, and strategy did we get to the place that everybody in a posture review wants to jump to right away, which are the money and force posture issues um, and force sizing issues and force uh, structure issues. We only looked at those capability issues after having made decisions at a high level about roles and strategy. Um, and that focused that discussion. And it actually, I think, enabled the Trump administration to come to the decision that there were two supplemental capabilities required to implement our strategy for dealing with that specific aspect of the Russian threat um, that was identified in the, in the deep dive. Um, so that little sort of description of how that works is one of the reasons I think methodology matters, because if you do the, a rigorous methodology and you follow it and you're disciplined, and we were, and, uh, you know, it, 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 as Rob said, it was painful at times doing it that way. Um, but what you end up with at the end is a you have, if not, if not agreement of everyone that was involved with the ultimate outcome that is decided by senior leadership, there's a common understanding of how that decision was arrived at. And there's a logic chain that you can pull all the way back to threat, role, strategy, capability, uh, that also enables everyone subsequently when you move to implementation and you move to budget presentation on the Hill, there's a common story that everyone is familiar with about how we arrived at this decision and why we arrived at this decision. And I think that's very helpful when you get to the implementation and the budget advocacy phase on the Hill. Um, let's see. Um, so now let me just talk a little bit about my experience with implementation of these. Um, so as both Elaine and Rob said, the, these things are really exhausting to be they're exhausted to be involved in. They're especially exhausting if you're running them, right? And all three of us have done that. Um, and it's, it's exhausting. Um, and that has implications for implementation because the nuclear community, while we had fairly broad participation across, I'm gonna focus this on DOD, fairly broad participation across DOD, broader than just the narrow sort of nuclear forces and weapons community, um, when you get to implementation, most of the implementation is done within that more narrow community. 
unless you're doing things like nuclear conventional integration, and then you have to drag other parts of the military into the problem. Uh, but most of the implementation is act actually, the classified implementation actually takes place in the more narrow nuclear community. And that's the part of the, that, those are the participants in an NPR who are exhausted at the end. <laughs> Right. Um, so and I think a good example is, and I, I, again, I wasn't in the Pentagon then, but in 2010, when the Obama guys finished the 2010 NPR, all the people in the nuclear community, especially the policy side, immediately slewed to New Start and negotiating New Start, and and didn't really have time to focus on an implementation directive and and putting out. Um, that kind of developing a process for how to implement. Um, so a lesson I've learned from these is it's very important to have a very senior leader, either the secretary or the deputy secretary, and again, I'm talking within the Pentagon, sign out an implementation directive that is very explicit, tasks specific people with specific things with a specific due date, and then have a process that holds their feet to the fire. And the way the Trump administration guys did that was um, there was a quarterly meeting with the, after the NPR was over with the deputy secretary and the vice chairman where OSD and the joint staff had come in and basically explain where we were on all the outstanding tasks and why. Uh, and nobody wants to go into that meeting and say, yeah, you know, we really haven't done anything on this yet. <laughs> Right. So that, it was a forcing function. It wasn't perfect, but it was a forcing function. And a lot of a lot of the things were actually implemented. I mean, a really good example of that, although it was done at DOE, it was tracked at DOD, was how rapidly we were able to implement the W76-2 uh, being built and deployed. Um, but in the sort of counter example is despite a task to move out on slick men, the administration really didn't move out, in my opinion, quickly enough on slick men. Um, and, and as a result, when the, when the Biden administration came in, there really wasn't a program of record in place for slick men. Um, so, uh, which I think made it easier for them to make a decision to cancel. Um, so that, those are kind of my main observations about this. Um, I really can't say what I know about what's in the 21 slash 22 NPR, because one, so it may have changed some since I left at the end of March, although I don't think it did, but it hasn't been released with, with the exception of budget implications and, uh, and declaratory policy. So I'll leave it at that and leave time for other questions. Great, thank you, Greg. All right, so um, just a reminder, we're gonna, we're gonna turn to Q&A now. Um, for folks in the room, please raise your index cards really, really high um, so that um, the team can, can come around and collect those. Uh, and, and just a reminder that for folks online as well, um, please use the, the chat function for, for the questions. Uh, so I, I want to go back. Um, I'm going to start with kind of going back to to a theme that that came up in uh, in the first first panel on integrated deterrence. Um, and so, Greg, I, I want to start with you. Um, there's been a fair amount again of of the limited um, pieces that we've we've seen and heard about um, this year's NPR. Um, one thing that we have heard a lot about is how it is nested, um, both within the national defense strategy, which is then nested within the national security. Strategy strategy. Um, so, so Greg, my first question to you is, um, from the methodology that you described, that sounded remarkably consistent between 2018 and 2021, 22. Um, so did you actually see that, that nesting? What did that look like in practice? Uh, and, and did that change um, the, the approach and the, de the debates in, in any meaningful way to kind of have that, that nesting or whether we want to use global integration here too? Um, what, what did that look like um, from, from your perspective on, uh, on the ground, so to speak? Okay, so I want to be a little careful about what I say about this, but I, there's some things I feel I can say. So, um, so what I probably should have mentioned in my opening remarks is that while the 2021-22 NPR followed agreed to follow the same four-step process of threat, role, strategy, capabilities. 
it, it, it did not, in my opinion, do that in the same disciplined way that the, the, that the 2018 review did. Um, they did not stop and take things sequentially up for senior leadership discussion, for example. Um, so if you don't have a senior leader decision on the role of nuclear weapons in your strategy, how do you have a discussion about what your declaratory policy should be? I mean, your declaratory policy is your public description of the role of nuclear weapons in your strategy to some extent. But if you haven't made a decision yet about roles, how do you make it, how do you have a useful conversation about declaratory policy? Um, so uh, there was significant cross discussion between the people doing the NDS and and there was a subset of the people doing NDS that were developing the integrated deterrence concept um, and the people who were doing the nuclear posture review. Um, but I would call it uh, not, not very structured and intermittent. Um, we had people that were involved in the NPR had, did have significant opportunities to have input to what was going on in the NDS and the integrated insurance concept development. Um, and, you know, I, I can say a lot of our recommendations from the joint staff were adopted in, in, in both of those other efforts. Um, but it wasn't a, I would, it wasn't a structured and deeply rigorous integration of the, those three efforts. Uh, that's not to say that I think in the end they are uncoordinated in any way or in some way um, contradictory, um, but it wasn't as rigorous a process as I would have preferred to see. So that's that's interesting. I want to I want to pick up on that a little bit. Um, you know, if that if that integration um, wasn't quite there or as 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 prevalent um, in practice, uh, one one thing Elaine mentioned was um, again this kind of idea of a, a strategic posture. Um, uh, review overall. And this is something that um, Brad Roberts, who's going to be joining us for the, the next panel, um, he had, he a few years ago put out a piece that said it's time to do away with NPRs. Uh, and what the way that we should be approaching this is to think about um, who are we trying to deter and what are we trying to deter them from doing uh, and think about all capabilities and assets um, that, that you have available uh, to deter those actions. So again, kind of connecting this back to our discussion this morning on integrated deterrence. Uh, he, he didn't call it that, but it, it sure, uh, sure, sure sounds like it. Um, so, so I guess my question for all of you is, do you think that type of review, given the beast of a process that you guys have all just described, um, is that type of review actually even feasible to do in in um, in reality? Can you can you actually really start to um, think about bringing again kind of all all capabilities um, from the conventional uh, from the information domain, kind of all, all of the things? Uh, is that type of review um, is it doable and and does it help um, in in taking a longer view to future nuclear strategy? So if you don't mind, Kelsey, let, let me address that first, um, because it kind of links to what I was just talking about. So, uh, uh, so I think, so I don't, again, I don't know if Brad's right that we shouldn't do NPRs anymore, but I do think that kind of comprehensive view of what our strategy should be is, is definitely required. And I agree with you that what Brad is advocating for sounds a lot and looks a lot and smells a lot like integrated deterrence. But it, but it, but I think Brad would say it goes beyond just deterrence strategy. It's also about warfighting strategy. Um, but I would say this, if you do in a nuclear posture review, if you look at the role of nuclear weapons in our national security strategy in the right way, you are basically looking at how nuclear weapons are integrated into the broader strategy. Right. In other words, when you you're not just saying like we did in 2018, here are the four roles of nuclear weapons in our strategy. Any down select of specific roles rules out other roles for nuclear weapons in our strategy. Right. Which means something else is doing those things right in the strategy. Um, 
so and then if you adopt a policy that says I want to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in our strategy or um, reduce the salience of nuclear weapons in my strategy, well, then you need to find, you either need to abandon some of the objectives of your previous strategy or find new ways to achieve those objectives, which means with other tools. Um, so I, I, I I think, I do think, and I don't want to overstate this idea that there wasn't any integration because there was some. You know, the NDS looked at the whole problem. The NDS included looking at what role nuclear weapons play in the national defense strategy, obviously. Um, so I, I do think, I don't know that I would do it as a formal review. Like, you know, Elaine said, look, if you're if you're not going to release an unclassified NPR, don't announce you're doing one. That doesn't mean you're not doing one. It just means you don't announce you're doing one, right? Um, so I think I, I think there's a natural uh, uh, integrated look at the highest level of strategy development in the department. Um, and I don't know that I would say we need to announce that we're doing such a review and then come up with some kind of an unclassified report to describe the strategy. Rob? I think I would agree with Greg. Look, I, I'm not sure we have a conference room big enough to accommodate all the people that would have to be involved in such a review. But in fact, the, the, the integration, uh, if you want to add a, a, another council where the, the heads of the, uh, the nuclear posture review, the missile defense review, the space review, the cyber review get together and review uh, you know, each particular segment, make sure there's coordination, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. In fact, what I did was uh, the, the, uh, the DASD who led the national defense strategy, Bridge Colby, was literally in the office next door to mine. So we would constantly uh, communicate and I understood where they were headed. They were headed towards great power competition, focus on China. It wasn't non-proliferation, it wasn't terrorism, because if it was those two, then that would alter the way we think about the role of nuclear weapons in our, in our force posture. So we were, we were coordinated, we were linked up. Um, I managed to coordinate with the director of the Missile Defense Review, because that was me, right? Uh, but, but we also had, you know we, had the, we had the joint staff, and we had the acquisition officials there. And you know, we, we asked the fundamental questions. You know, what, what is the role of missile defense in US nuclear strategy and nuclear deterrence? And we determined er, early on that we'll rely on nuclear deterrence vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, Russian and Chinese threats, but we will use homeland missile defense to deter against rogues. So we had we had effectively integrated, right, the two the two two reviews. So I I think um, I, I think uh, I, I agree again. Agree with with Greg. L let's provide guidance from the deputy secretary or or some other senior official uh, for how you're going to. Uh, uh, effectively integrate uh, the reviews, May maybe create some overarching official who brings in the directors at the appropriate time to review w where they're headed. But that's it. You know, w if you try to put everybody into one room to integrate the whole thing, it's going to be totally unmanageable. Elaine, any, anything to add? Uh, yeah, as one who wrote in 2001 that we needed a strategic posture review, not a new posture review, I really should say that we need to, to lump more of the strategic capabilities together when we think about uh, nuclear posture review. That being said, oh my God, there's so many organizations that you have to have, so many piece parts to the nuclear issue that you really do have to do a deep dive on that. Um, yes, it has to be nested in something broader. Many ways to do that. Uh, I, I like, I like uh, Rob's suggestion of having the leads on the different reviews periodically meet together, figure out whether they are going in the same trajectory or not, and maybe briefing that from time to time to DepSec Devin Vice Chairman, for instance. But um, given that the shin bone is connected to the knee bone, which is connected to the thigh bone, et cetera, you really can't, you can't, and I don't think mostly we have looked at nuclear as just nuclear. There's this trend that says, no, it's connected to other things. Even if they're unique, they're connected to other things and how we approach who we're trying to deter, what we're trying to deter them from, and so forth. So um, what the happy medium is when you can't, um, yeah, it's a problem in arms control. It's a problem in these reviews. It gets so big that it's unmanageable, uh, and yet you have to connect the piece parts and different 
different reviews will find different ways to do that, but they need to do it somehow. All right, so I think you uh, all three signed up to uh, to help with that in the future. So wait, wait for that phone call. All right, so uh, a question from the audience. Um, just having, and I think Rob, this uh, this is probably for you, but um, but again, uh, open to, to other thoughts as well. Uh, just having a public glossy NPR versus a more private, less visible NPR invite more congressional scrutiny uh, or policy decisions? No, not at all. I mean, Congress, uh, We'll, we'll get the information they need. And the fact that what, what, the, the glossy creates um, uh, uh, fire and smoke within the, the think tank community and, uh, you know, the press, the media, uh, all those that are trying to, uh, to make a, uh, to find uh, a fissures and areas of disagreement between the, the various schools of thought. Congress gets the information that it needs. We go up there and brief them. We, they participate in the reviews. Uh, any administration that fails to keep Congress uh, apprised of uh, what their plans and programs are will shame on them, okay? So it, it's, not, it's not the glossiness. In fact, I think sometimes the glossiness might add, actually detract from the seriousness of the document. Uh, and uh, I, I, I regret that as well, but uh, no, uh, Congress gets the information that it needs. If I could just add one thing about that. I actually think you know, I'm interested in Rob's view on this, actually. I think he'd agree. Uh, I actually think having, I don't know that it needs to be glossy, but having a published unclassified NPR helps with the communication with Congress because it gives you an approved set of text on key issues that DOD members who are testifying on the Hill can go back to and refer back to and say, well, Senator, as we said in the nuclear posture review, and just read from it, right? And then you're, it, it, there, it, there's a common agreed interagency position on all the issues that are addressed in the NPR. Um, and without that, you can create that in the interagency with hard Q and A's, but it's harder to do that way than it is if you have an agreed document. No, I, I agree with you, Greg, 100%. All right, so another uh, question from the audience. Uh, it says, this question is for Greg. Uh, do you think that Slick em in uh, sea launch nuclear arm cruise missile, uh, is a good idea? Why or why not? Well, was that, I'm was just that asking softball? the question. Greg, Greg, did you pay somebody to ask you that question? I'm sorry, what was, I didn't hear what that last comment was. Did, did you pay somebody to ask you that question, Greg? No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> but I also don't think, I thought everybody already knew what I thought about this. Um, so uh, my personal view is that Slickaman is an important augmentation of our planned modernization program. Um, the original, the origin of our recommendation, and, and it was a joint staff recommendation. This was not something the Trump administration came up with on their own. The joint staff recommended Slickaman in the context of the NPR. Um, so um, I do think it's an important and necessary augmentation of our capability. Um, its origin was, as I said earlier, in a in designed to address in the longer term Russian strategy and doctrine regarding the role of nuclear weapons in their theater strategy. Uh, but I think Slick Amend, the reason Slick Amend, I think, is the right solution to the augmentation that I view is necessary is it's equally useful in the Asian theater. Um, you know, and subsequent to the 2018 NPR, we've learned a lot more about where China is going and how fast, how rapidly, and how far they intend to expand their nuclear capabilities. And I think Slick Amend is far superior to uh, either the air, the air leg, like dual capable fighter aircraft or uh, ground based systems. If you were to build intermediate range ground based systems in Asia, simply because there's a lack of available basing in Asia for both of those capabilities. And there is already going to be designed into the United States Navy a very large number of launchers capable of launching slick men, the attack submarine force, a very large number. Um, and so uh, you don't need to build delivery systems beyond the missile itself. 
Um, I think it's an ideal solution for a wide variety of reasons, but one is um, on attack submarines, it's launchable inside the outer layers of an adversary's A2AD system, so it doesn't have to fight its way all the way through because you can bring submarines in close inside the outer layers of defenses. Um, it doesn't require allies to make the hard political decision to take additional U.S. nuclear weapons or any nuclear weapons at all on their territory. Um, it provides a continuous deterrence presence even when it's not present because adversaries don't know where our attack submarines are on a day-to-day -day basis when they're not important. Um, I believe that it would give us some utility as arms control leverage to try to capture Russian sea-launched nuclear cruise missiles in a future arms control agreement or potentially Chinese. Um, and I think without some additional theater, non-strategic nuclear capability to find as what's not limited by New START. Um, you have zero chance of getting the Russians to agree to any limits on their non-strategic systems, because why would they? They have a huge advantage in that category, and we're not, without Slickerman, we're doing nothing to change that and nothing to increase the threat to them. Uh, and I think because Slickerman um, poses a multi-azimuth uh, and well, multi azimuth and very highly penetratable threat, the Russians would view it as a very significant threat and a very significant addition to our capability. Um, so that, that's a quick summary. I mean, I can probably go deeper, but I'll leave it at that. And I'm more than happy to have somebody argue with me about it. Greg, thanks. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. I just wanted to add a little, a little texture to this. You know, one of the previous uh, speakers uh, made it seem as if uh, the people who supported the additional theater nuclear weapons, it's just a matter of tossing nuclear weapons at the problem. And uh, I, I want people to understand that uh, the, the decision to pursue the nuclear sea launch cruise missile was literally the last decision taken by the Secretary of Defense in the nuclear posture review. All right? It, it was, it was uh, uh, not an easy decision to take, but it was made for exactly the reasons that Greg uh, 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 enumerated, and uh, it was it was it was done with an eye towards not only reassuring our allies, but making sure that we've deterred our adversary, but doing in a, doing so in a way that wouldn't cause an arms race or exacerbate or, 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 or do something to, to jeopardize arms control, right? Because the, the the sea launch cruise missile is not covered under the New Star Treaty. So if there are, way, there are ways that we could try to uh, counter Russia's nuclear advantage that could actually include um, uh, uh, r raising uh, limits or violating the New START Treaty. But we specifically avoided that, right, to keep arms control in place while addressing this, uh, this at, the, at the theater level. And so I just want people to understand that reasonable people are going to disagree about this. And, and you, you, you see that 95% of what we recommended in Trump was recommended in Obama, right? It's, 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 a, it's a credit to uh, the current nuclear modernization program and our, and our current nuclear posture uh, that, that we can cover. Uh, the, we felt we could cover the growing Russian and Chinese threats at the time. The big thing that kept us awake at night was uh, the disparity in Russian tactical nuclear weapons or non-strategic nuclear weapons, and that has become even worse now as a result of uh, China's uh, expansion of nuclear forces. So take all the reasons why we thought it was important in 2018 and add to that now what we know about China. Well, I suspect this debate will uh, will certainly continue to uh, to, to play out as uh, as the Hill um, decides uh, whether or not to, to fund it. So, I, to be continued, watch this space. Um, I, I did want to follow up, though. Um, again, kind of in the in the previous panel, this this came up um, quite a few times, um, and I, I want to ask a little bit of a different question in terms of the operational impact for the Navy. Um, and I think there have been some concerns raised about again um, so much um, the, the operational tempo tempo. Is is, is so high for the Navy right now anyway, that uh, if, if you go down the Slickham route, does that 
uh, add an additional tax, so to speak, and how do you, again, um, in, the, in the bigger picture, kind of rack and stack between conventional and, and nuclear capabilities, um, can, you, can you talk about how you, how you thought about those trade-offs? Sure. Well, first, let me just say that the, uh, the, the CNO and the Secretary of Navy at the time uh, 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 endorsed the nuclear posture review, including those recommendations. So they, they took that under consideration. And of course, this is going to uh, provide um, uh, additional duties uh, to the Navy, but I don't think it's going to interfere uh, with uh, their operational um, uh, uh, de deployments or operational readiness to any uh, extent that would be that would jeopardize our conventional deterrent. Again, as as, as Greg pointed out, we're, we're going to have probably at least 60 to 70 nuclear attack submarines. Okay. Some percentage of those will have the nuclear sea launch cruise missile, right? The, the adversary doesn't know. I mean, it could be 10 ships, okay? And on those Recording ships, in progress. And on those 10, was that the, the Chinese listening? <laughs> but, and on those 10 ships, you might have X number, a small number of uh, nuclear sea launch cruise missiles, right? Out of, by the time you deploy the Virginia payload module on these submarines, you've got capacity to hold maybe 150 cruise missiles. And so, get, you know, put five nuclear missiles, 10 nuclear missiles on them. That's not going to impact. Now, you have, you have a, a personal reliability program. You've got additional security. You've got to certify crews. You've got to provide security. We understand all that because we went through that during the Cold War, right? Because we already deployed a nuclear Tomahawk land attack missile. This is going to have an effect on the Navy, but if you ask the Navy to do it, they will figure out a way to minimize uh, the, uh, the, the operational distractions and get it done. But look, don't take my word for it. Cer certainly, we, we need to do the studies. The Navy needs to come up with its concept of operations. Uh, we've completed an analysis of alternatives for the different types of systems. But by all means, Congress, provide the funding and uh, get the questions to the, get the answers to the questions that you need to make a decision. All right, so yeah, another me, question. If I, if I could just add one, one point to that. I mean, there's, not, there's nothing in our thinking about the role of Slick Command and our strategy and, and how we might operate it. There's nothing in any of that sort of concept of operations thinking that I was ever exposed to that would change the way the Navy would be operating its attack submarines on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, we're not going to be putting there's no concept under consideration that I ever saw that would say we were going to take a portion of the attack submarine fleet and put it on nuclear deterrent patrol, right? It's it's much more the way Rob described it. Um, you know, no decisions were ever made about how many would be carried by how many boats because we never got that far. Um, but I, I agree with Rob that all of that is manageable, uh, and I think the Navy thinks it's manageable too. I mean, would individual attack submarine commanders rather not have to deal with nuclear weapons on their boats? Probably, right? Um, but there's other things they'd rather not deal with on their boats that they have on their boats. So, you know, I mean, if it's a mission, the Navy will, will salute and, and perform it. All right. Well, I, like I said, I, I'm sure to be continued on, on all things Slickum. Uh, all right. So another question from the audience. Uh, to what extent uh, does the U.S. industrial base concerns come up in NPR efforts? Uh, it's known that nuclear and missile modernization um, are undermanned, and it cites uh, lack of contractors, uh, and a lack of intellectual capital, uh, university grads, empty shipyards. Uh, do those types of questions and concerns uh, come into play in these types of reviews? And if not, where do they? Well, I mean, as I, as I pointed out, we had a, a Department of Energy NNSA representative in at the working group. So it was their, their job to explain to us what the constraints are. Right, uh, and, and so you have to take that into account, both in terms of the recommendations we make for uh, additional attention, additional resources uh, uh, to get the job done, but it also informs what is in the realm of possibility. So for us to, uh, uh, for any administration to say that, hey, we're just gonna build or deploy another 200 ICBMs, well, you, you can't do that, right? Because, because you, you, have, you have to build these and they're not gonna be available till, 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 uh, till the next decade. There are, there are, there are, there are limitations in, in what you can do, and these are real constraints 
on, um, on the types of recommendations you might make. Yeah, Kelsey, the only thing I'd add to what Rob said, and he's exactly right, obviously you don't want to be making recommendations that are not implementable due to industrial base issues. But there's another aspect of taking industrial based questions um, explicitly into account, and that is to assess, well, if the industrial base is inadequate to build the force required to support our strategy, what do we need to do to make sure we have an industrial base that can support the strategy, right? That's, uh, you know, and, and I, it's also a, an important element of thinking through what our hedge strategy is, right? And having an industrial base that is resilient enough and flexible enough to uh, address problems that might occur with a, with a critical weapon system um, in a timely manner. So uh, I think any useful NPR would have to take that full scope of industrial-based questions into account. Elaine? And just to add, every in, all five NPRs have to either a greater or lesser extent take an industrial base as well as nuclear weapons infrastructure into account. You have to. Yep. Okay, so next question. In the context of the NPR process, uh, what is the appropriate balance between str strategic ambiguity and transparency for the sake of risk reduction? Who wants to jump in? Well, all right, so I'll jump in. Um, so I guess first I would, or push back a little bit on the underlying premise of the question, which is that somehow strategic ambiguity um, it, it somehow runs against risk reduction. Strategic ambiguity may reduce risk, right, depending on an adversary's decision calculus. Um, so, and the example I would give is if you have an adversary that is risk averse in their behavior, um, they're going to tend to see ambiguity as a problem to be solved and, and, and a problem regarding making a decision to launch an attack, for example. Uh, if you have a risk acceptant adversary, especially a very highly risk acceptant adversary, uh, strategic ambiguity could be a problem for deterrence, right? You might need to be much more explicit about the response that you'll deliver um, if they if deterrence fails. Um, so that the question is a good one, but I think it has sort of an underlying premise that ambiguity automatically increases risk, and I, and I don't think that's the case. I, uh, I agree, Greg, and uh, to the extent that, that it, it may increase any risk, I think the ultimate solution is to make your forces more survivable. Because if your forces are survivable, uh, you can you can deal with a certain amount of ambiguity and know that no matter what the adversary does, you'll be able to to, to respond in a way that uh, would inflict unacceptable damage against what the uh, what the adversary values most. Right. So if if you're concerned about uh, uh, any uh, ambiguity, uh, if if you're concerned about these so-called use them or lose them or you know get the first strike in before the second strike, if you have survivable forces, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Elaine, you looked like you wanted to jump in on that. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, usually when we talk strategic ambiguity, we're talking about declaratory policy, uh, which is something that every NPR, again, has looked at uh, and debated. And, you know, sometimes there's more debate, sometimes there's less debate. They come to agreement. But but in the end, uh, everyone has n not wanted to say exactly what you would do if, 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 because you can't. Look, every situation is different. I agree with the first panel on this. Uh, it, it's really uh, about, it's very context specific. So there's obviously gonna be some ambiguity. You know, who's the adversary? What's their objective? What's your stake? What's their, it, look, um, very blanket declaratory policy doesn't work very well. Um, and I find that sometimes the emphasis that's put on declaratory policy doesn't relate to the adversary necessarily. It, it, um, because adversaries tend to disbelieve declaratory policy anyway. So I, I, again, I guess I'm agreeing with, uh, with Greg that the, 
if, if that's the meaning of strategic ambiguity, that it doesn't necessarily necessarily relate to um, whether there's stability and risk reduction and so forth. So. Okay, next question. Should the U.S. do more to pressure our allies to conduct their own nuclear posture reviews more regularly? Look, it, it's not up to us to tell the, uh, the allies how to run their nuclear business. Uh, they conduct reviews uh, on a regular basis. Uh, in fact, when we conduct our own reviews, they, um, they have an input into those reviews, which of course requires them to conduct a review, so they know how to impact. So, um, look, we, we have formal mechanisms, and, and Elaine can speak uh, uh, to this even better than I. We have extended deterrence dialogues with the, the key nuclear allies. Uh, that's the way we keep them informed. Uh, that's the way we can, in some manner, prompt them to, uh, to probe the important uh, nuclear issues of the day. Um, yeah, so if it's if we're talking the British and the French who do have nuclear weapons, they do post reviews, the French president every year sits down and looks. Anyway, uh, if we're talking NATO, NATO just put out a big new uh, strategic concept with, with some, um, and, and it, that included nuclear issues as well. Um, if we're talking, I mean, I, I don't quite understand the question and I certainly agree that independent allies get to do their own reviews. Um, and we do, I'm impressed with how much this this last last one and really all the other ones, except maybe the first one uh, in, uh, and the second one, included allies in the consultations about our nuclear posture reviews. All right, another follow-up question from the audience. Uh, if our adversaries released an NPR, would we believe them? So I think you can maybe interpret that question as um, for for what our adversaries do say publicly about their own nuclear posture. Uh, what what is the reaction uh, to that as well as they go through this reviews? So let, let me take a cut at that. Um, so I, I don't I don't know that we believe them, but depending on what it said, we would draw conclusions about whether it provided us insight into how they view the role of nuclear weapons and their strategy and how they think about the problem. So it would be gross military incompetence to assume that China's no first use policy, for example, will be implemented as stated if we get in a major conflict. We have to contingency plan as though the Chinese might change their mind and decide to use nuclear weapons first. Um, but what the Russians released uh, in 20, I can't remember if it was 2020 or not, um, anyway, the recent UCAS that the, that the Russians released regarding their nuclear doctrine um, provides, I think, some very useful insights into Russian thinking about the role of nuclear weapons in their strategy. And it led to very interesting dialogue with them before they invaded Ukraine again uh, during strategic um, stability talks in both the, the Trump and um, Biden administrations. Uh, between the, our joint staff and the Russian general staff and between DOD and MOD. Uh, we had some very interesting conversations with them. It, th them releasing that document gave us something to base a series of questions to ask them for clarification, for to raise concerns we had about some of the things they said and had, a, and we had a very interesting dialogue that I think both sides left uh, that dialogue with an improved understanding of each other's view of how nuclear weapons might come to be introduced into a conflict. Um, and I think that enhances stability. All right, so we are going to move to um, closing comments. So I'm going to I'm going to turn back to uh, to the three of you again. Anything that you want to add or amplify? Uh, but I, I think this has been um, it's been a really process heavy uh, discussion, wh which I think is good because I think um, you know thinking through again the the approach that um, that's taken and the methodology and how that actually influences um, how we think about the role of nuclear weapons and and what that the the force uh, requirements are going forward. Uh, that, that process piece, piece plays a really important role. Um, so I will do one, one quick final round. Um, and Rob, I'll, I'll start with you for anything that you want to add. I'll, I'll just say how much I'm struck by the, uh, the, the degree of continuity 
between the, the reviews. And in fact, if you look at the, the core uh, of, of what our nuclear policy and strategy is, the roles for nuclear weapons, um, the limited controlled uh, use of nuclear weapons as opposed to you know, massive retaliation, all these things were established back in the 1960s or 1970s. And uh, uh, whether they were formal NPRs or not, uh, we, have, we have basically maintained that, that approach over, over seven decades. And uh, I, I think that, that's suggesting. Thanks. Greg, over to you. Um, yeah, I guess I have one final comment. Um, I would point, so when the 2018 NPR was released, there was a lot of sort of think tank commentary that, that said that the declaratory policy changes made in the 2018 NPR increased the role of nuclear weapons in US strategy. Um, so I guess I would issue a challenge to everybody there at the at your event to take what has been released now and what will be released, I assume, somewhat in the near future regarding the, uh, the new Biden declaratory policy um, and ignore who what administration said either thing, take away the political bias and read the language of the two and tell me which one it provides a narrower set of circumstances under which the United States might consider the use of nuclear weapons, the Trump one or the Biden one. All right, Elaine, bring us home. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to decide whether to weigh in at all on the Slickham issue. I don't disagree with anything that Greg and Rob said. However, I would. I, I had an interesting discussion at a at a not for attribution, but I'll just say that I heard a European presenter say that they focus on, gee, you don't have to deploy these on ally soil as a plus for Slickham. They interpreted it as we we're trying to cut them out of the decision making process. So it was it was a it was one I had not heard before. The other is I agree that it might provide some uh, arms control leverage, but only in my experience you have to go all the way through to deployment before the Russians are willing to give up something. They, they're not going to give it up for nothing, as in paper studies and so forth. So uh, just as as the Pershing II and the Glickum had to be actually deployed for us to get to an INF treaty, I think for it to have arms control leverage. You have to spend a whole lot of money on it and make it all the way through to deployment for it to have that. Um, the, the other thing I'd say is that for those of you who work in the nuclear arena, um, you, you're doing arms control things, you're working on analysis, you think about deterrence, you're writing about it, you're in think tanks someplace. If you get an opportunity to uh, be seconded to do an IPA, whatever, to get involved in an NPR in the future, take it, take it, because it really does, it really does give you the soup to nuts view and it opens your eyes to things that from the outside, you just don't see or think about. So I would just encourage anybody to get that stuff on, just go ahead and step in that stuff, even if you can't get it off your shoe. <laughs> Well, that's great. Uh, I, honestly, all three of you really, really appreciate uh, you, you all taking the time to, to join us today. Uh, stay tuned in this space when the 2022, uh, hopefully it's actually 2022, uh, come, comes out. Uh, we will we'll look to, uh, to all three of you for, for your, uh, your comments and thoughts as well and look, look forward to continuing the conversation. So please, uh, everyone here in the room, join me in thanking our, our panelists. So this will be our uh, last panel, and I'm really, really thrilled uh, to be chairing this one on integrating arms control and deterrence. Um, and just for a little bit of shameless CSIS self-promotion, um, hang on, can you guys hear me online? Well, I'll let, um, I'll let the AV Heather, people if you're speaking, that. we cannot hear you. Thanks for flagging that, Greg. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for flagging that. Um, well, 
the only thing you missed was me saying I'm really excited to chair this panel uh, with, for, with all three of you. Um, but also just to very quickly plug um, some work that CSIS has been doing on the concept of integrated arms control. Uh, we released a, a report on this topic back in January. Uh, it was me, my predecessor, Rebecca Herzman, and also Susie Clays from the Pony team. Um, and so to be now able to kind of turning it into a panel, talking about it in the context of the NPR is really exciting. Uh, and this is, for me, a bit of a dream panel, to be honest. We, we have Rose Gottemuller, uh, Brad Roberts, and Gaukar Mukajanova. Uh, Rose Scott Miller is the um, Stephen C. Hazy lecturer at Stanford's Freeman Spokley Institute for International Studies um, and its Center for International Security and Cooperation. Before joining Stanford, uh, she was the Deputy Secretary General of NATO from 2016 to 2019, where she helped drive forward NATO's adaptation to new security challenges in Europe and in the fight against terrorism. Prior to joining NATO, she served for nearly five years as the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security at the State Department and advised the Secretary of State on arms control, nonproliferation, and political military affairs. Our second speaker will be Dr. Brad Roberts, uh, who has served as the director of the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Lab since 2015. From 2009 to 2013, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy. So we've had a couple of those system um, DASDs, and uh, so Brad is joining that crew. Uh, in this role, he served as Policy Director of the Obama Administration's NPR and the Ballistic Missile Defense Review, and he led their implementation. Finally, we have Gaukar Mukajanova, uh, who is the Director for International Organizations and Nonproliferation Program at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. She served, as an, she served as an expert on the delegation of Kazakhstan to the 2010 Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference and on the delegation of Chile to the 2015 NPT Review Conference. She also advised the delegation of Chile to the negotiations of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in 2017. So three truly expert speakers on this topic. Um, I also do kind of want to flag, partially for our speakers joining us, that this is um, the only panel really dedicated to arms control. And arms control has come up a little bit earlier in the discussions today. Our first panel was on integrated deterrence uh, with a um, really rich conversation that got a lot, I think, into allies' perspectives. And then our second panel was uh, on the NPR process more so. But so really focusing on arms control, I think, is going to be a new thread to the conversation. Uh, and again, thank, thank you to all three of you so much for joining, um, especially because I know it's very different times for all of you. Uh, and so really appreciate that. To get us started, uh, I'm going to first turn it over to Rose. Rose, thank you so much. Thank you very much, and uh, really looking forward to our discussion. You might be hearing some noise in the background. I'm here at a, a meeting, and people are just taking a break here as well, so there might be a little noise in the corridor for a moment. But uh, I'll run through the questions quickly, uh, not all of them thoroughly, but uh, quickly, I think, in a way that I hope will, will lay some good ground for discussion. The first question is, can arms control and deterrence work in tandem? And I'd like to broaden that a little bit by uh, focusing on what I think is a reality, and that is that diplomacy and deterrence always work in tandem. Uh, I'll uh, tell the story uh, that I reheard again just last week when uh, Bill Burns, the director of the CIA, was at the uh, Aspen Security Forum out in Colorado, and he spoke about his trip in November to Moscow to talk to Vladimir Putin face to face and to say to him, we know exactly what you're up to. We understand you are intensively preparing for an invasion of Ukraine. We are supremely concerned about this and there will be a price to pay if you proceed in this way. Deterrence in that case did not work, but it was an excellent example of what I am talking about. That is that diplomacy and deterrence do go hand in hand and they go hand in hand in the midst of crisis as in day in, day out diplomatic endeavor. And so I can say that in the course of the negotiations I've been involved in over time, of course, you are often trying to achieve results at the negotiating table, get to yes on a particular agreement, on a particular aspect of an agreement, but you can also use that setting to uh, deliver deterrence messages of all kinds from let us ensure that this negotiation remains confidential 
If you start megaphoning this negotiation in the press, it will be to the detriment of our results and we will not achieve a good outcome. So that's a kind of tactical uh, step that you can take or you can deliver a big deterrence message uh, related to uh, the fact that the United States will be ready to respond should there be uh, a Soviet in the past or, or Russian uh, activity of a certain kind, Chinese, it goes for other countries as well. I know that a lot is going on now in the exchanges, although we are not directly at the table with Iran, but a lot of, uh, of uh, maneuvering, I'm sure, is going on to convey these messages in the diplomatic space about what the implications would be for Iran of not uh, not uh, acceding to a resumption of the JCPOA and, and uh, some other steps that we would like to see them take. My only point here is that uh, there is a verbal component to uh, deterrence always. And in my view, it's in fact the ideal messaging medium. You can go about it in all different kinds of ways. You can message with the posture of your weapons. You can message with the way you're flying your bombers around. You can message in the way the military are communicating, but that too has a diplomatic aspect to it. And often the military in participating in arms control negotiations can be especially effective in conveying messages about military capacity and capability as well as future plans, potential plans. And so uh, there is a kind of interweaving of uh, diplomacy and deterrence, I think, that we need to be considering more fully and really embracing as an aspect of what we need to do. If there's anything that concerns me about this current moment in the crisis with you, with the Russians in Ukraine, is the fact that our lines of communication seem to be quite uh, quite stifled right now. I was very concerned hearing yesterday, Tony Blinken wanting to talk to Minister Lavrov. Lavrov didn't have uh, time enough, it appears. That, of course, was pursuant to a particular negotiation with regard to the release of our hostages. And I, I fully underscore that I'm calling them hostages uh, in the Russian Federation. Uh, but uh, the, the main point here is that uh, in this case, Lavrov himself was sending a message back to Blinken. So, of course, we'll have to deal with that and it will perhaps take some more time and some quiet exchanges on the ground. I understand that my old boss, Bill Richardson, is involved in these negotiations. So I'm sure there are some quiet and behind the scenes, uh, how shall I put it, messaging going on in that space as well. So to make a long story short, I do believe that there is a natural and inherent relationship between arms control and deterrence. They do work in tandem. It is part and parcel of our uh, of our way of, of working in order to steer the behavior of our counterparts, steer the behavior of uh, our, uh, you know, our opponents. Uh, and you do that by communications uh, mechanisms of all kinds. And it, in my view, once again, the most effective communications mechanisms are face-to-face -face when you can look the person in the eye and deliver, if you need to, a threat in no uncertain terms. And so uh, let's perhaps have some more discussion of that, but I do think that, that they do work together in, in that way. Now, uh, I want to combine the questions of the impact uh, of the Ukraine crisis with the future of strategic arms control, because of course, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, the egregious and completely unjustified invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation has interrupted what had become uh, a rhythm of strategic stability talks that was to lead up to uh, two things. It was to lead up to the establishment of a process for replacing the New START Treaty by February of 2026, and then furthermore to a larger discussion of topics related to strategic stability questions, particularly into the future where we are concerned about the interplay of new kinds of military capability coming online, new, some new technologies beginning to be weaponized and coming online, and the future of stability relationships, not only with the Russians, but also with the Chinese. And that was a second big topic to be tackled in this strategic stability dialogue. This has now been interrupted, much to my concern, by the way, because uh, on the back of those um, really 
terrible and um, talk about megaphone diplomacy, but the very public proposals that the Russians threw down in December, November and December, where they made all kinds of unwarranted demands. But I have to say to their credit, the Biden administration, as well as the NATO allies, took some careful steps to review what would form some useful bases for discussion, nevertheless, out of those ridiculous Russian uh, uh, proposals for new uh, agreements on European security. The administration and the NATO allies carefully sifted through, found some areas that I think would have been very beneficial, some of them re with regard to renewing constraints on intermediate range ground launch missiles, others with regard to renewing some elements of European security architecture, there were some uh, interesting, I thought, potent there was some interesting potential there. But uh, of course, we then found out in the way the Russians so roundly rejected any ideas we had for further discussions at the January strategic stability sessions. We, I think, and I know the administration then, it cemented the conclusion that they had already made that, uh, that uh, the Kremlin was preparing militarily uh, to invade Ukraine. And within a month, that had indeed happened. But nevertheless, um, I do hope that uh, when the time is ripe, and I have already spoken publicly about how I would see the conditionality, I will just review it brief briefly here. In my view, the conditions are there must be a stable ceasefire in place. Uh, Russia must have withdrawn to the February 24th line. That is the line where President Zelensky of Ukraine seems to be ready to resume negotiations if the Russians have withdrawn to that point. And we are in the in the course of uh, a stable peace process leading to reconstruction uh, in Ukraine. So I think at that point it may be possible to resume some talks with the Russians. I will tell you quite honestly, I would not um, take a lot of time on a larger strategic stability discussion when we eventually reach that point, I would go immediately to technical talks to establish a framework for new start follow-on negotiations. The reasons for that are twofold. First, I think the political actors on the U.S. and Russian side, as well as on the uh, NATO European side, are not really ready to engage. Nobody wants to sit down with Vladimir Putin right now. Summitry with, with the Russian president is out of the question. So I think we're going to need to build these negotiations from the ground up with technical level talks rather than from the top down, as we saw in June just last year when Biden and Putin met in Geneva and there out of that meeting launched uh, the, the round of strategic stability talks that was interrupted by the invasion. I really think we need to think about how uh, technical teams could nevertheless be invested by authority at high level in their capitals, but start building then the process from the ground up for a new start follow on negotiation. That would be my, my view. So I've given you my sense of what the future of strategic arms control should be. You can hear from what I say that I continue to believe it will be important to replace the new START treaty. I will happily discuss uh, during our Q&A and commentary period what that should look like, but I think we should be ready to go back to that table. We have since the SALT one agreement in 1972 had in place some negotiated restraint regarding our strategic nuclear force posture. And I think we should continue on that track if only to ensure predictability and stability of the Russian force structure, limits on the Russian force structure during our own nuclear modernization, which we really must carry forward now at an intensive and uh, I will say well-funded rate as well. Um, arms control and how it is perceived by the allies. There are, of course, those who are very skeptical and they have been because they are on the borderlands between Europe, Western Europe and, uh, and Russia and are concerned about concessions to the Russians. My view is always that we are clear about our own interests and the own, our own limits at the negotiating table, but then we can negotiate self-confidently in order to get constraints on the Russian side and we should not hesitate to negotiate because we are, of course, concerned about Russian behavior. Uh, but there are arguments about that. I was quite impressed 
suggest actually that again back in january and it's another example of the russians shooting themselves in the foot because they had finally gotten the europeans to agree to proceed to talk to them about some particular aspects such as renewing the european security ar architecture and establishing new constraints on intermediate ground launched missile systems so the russians the russians basically interrupted that process so uh, I will blame our NATO allies if they are, again, quite skeptical about resuming negotiations, especially, again, on the back of this egregious, uh, uh, egregious invasion of Ukraine. But uh, I think that uh, there is, I would say, more of a more of a knowledge and an understanding of the history of, of the success stories in Europe that uh, all NATO allies are willing to acknowledge now, including the fact that we were able to uh, ban INF through the INF Treaty in the late 1980s, and that was a net gain for European security for many decades. So perhaps I will leave it there. Um, and uh, look forward to our further discussion. I guess, Brad, over to you in that case. Uh, thank you. Uh, I assume I should just jump in at this point, Heather. I'm uh, grateful for the invitation to join in today's discussion. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share the panel with Rose and Gaukar. Uh, and, and I should clarify that m the views I'm expressing are my personal views and should not be attributed to my employer or its sponsors. And I wanted to join the discussion on, on three three of the questions, Heather. Um, to start with the first, can, can arms control and deterrence work, work in tandem? Uh, and, and Rose has given th the main answer to this question, which is not only can they, but they should, uh, and, and, and they often do. Uh, and, and the core idea is that, uh, that arms control can can reinforce deterrence by dealing with problems in the deterrence relationship between two countries concerned about deterring each other. Uh, and of course, a good example of this is the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which dealt with an emerging form of competition in the US-Soviet relationship, provided stability and predictability, uh, and stabilized the deterrence relationship. <clears throat> but I think the opposite proposition is also true. There are times when deterrence and arms control can work at opposite purposes. Uh, and, and again, we might take the ABM Treaty as an example. Um, at the end of the Cold War, the perceived threat to the United States from Soviet and uh, Chinese missiles was nil. Uh, the perceived threat of uh, Iraqi, future Iranian, future North Korean miss WMD-tipped missiles was tangible and mounting, uh, and the United States wanted uh, not to end up in a relationship of mutual deterrence with these countries, perceiving that such a relationship would be unstable. Uh, if you want to avoid a relationship of mutual vulnerability, missile defenses play an important role. Uh, and the treaty stood in the way of adjustments uh, to the strategic posture of the United States that that stabilize the relationship with uh, nuclear armed regional challengers. So, of course, in the real world, we have both uh, challengers and major powers, and, and the treaty was affecting both sets of relationships in complicated ways. Uh, another example of this ambiguous uh, relationship between arms control and deterrence, deterrence might be seen in the INF Treaty where in, in Europe, the INF Treaty provided a stabilizing uh, benefit uh, and, and helped to transform the Cold War confrontation. But in Asia, it's impaired the United States and its allies from responding to a, a significant buildup by, by China in a, in a manner that's directly threatening to those allies and to U.S. forces in the region. So. Can they work in tandem? Yes. Do they always work in tandem? No. Second, second question I wanted to address was how might arms control be perceived by deterrence skeptics? Well, this is an ambiguous question because uh, there are two ways to read the question. 
uh, how, how might arms control be perceived by skeptics of deterrence? Well, arms control might be perceived as, as a grand strategy. I'm reminded of a discussion we had here at CGSR a couple of years ago about grand strategies for the United States. We were discussing the national security strategy of the Trump administration, which didn't use the word leadership until chapter four in the chapter on economic nationalism. Uh, didn't offer a vision of leadership and we were talking about different models of grand strategies for the United States. Isolationism, engagement and leadership, expansion of the community, the democratic community, and enlargement and engagement. Uh, and, and someone said, well, we're, we're missing the most obvious grand strategy for the United States and that's arms control. Uh, and, and this should not be an instrument, but it should be a, a strategy. Uh, and, and this reflects one, one way of thinking, which, which I, f I find extreme, but it's a view of deterrence skeptics. Uh, another way to read the question um, points to a, a, a different uh, answer, uh, that, that these are, um, well, essentially that, that uh, arms control is a form of um, restraint, self-accepted, but that may fit, fit our needs poorly at a time when we need to compete rather than be restrained. Um, I also a little bit reject the premise of the question that there are two camps, that there are deterrence skeptics and there, there are deterrence friends. I, my experience is that um, these two camps are exaggerated and that most, most people lie somewhere in the middle. Uh, I certainly worked for a president, as did Rose, who saw the need for a balanced approach that uh, was skeptical of deterrence for some purposes, uh, reliant on deterrence for other purposes, and placed high value on arms control when it could make a practical improvement to our security environment. But let me turn to the third question. What is the future of strategic arms control? Um, Rose rightly emphasized, in my view, where our priorities should lie. Uh, we, we continue to have important national interests in uh, the continuation of the arms control regime. Uh, we have an interest in continuation of the reductions pathway. We have an interest in uh, transparency and predictability in the strategic relationship with Russia and, and now also with China. Uh, and, and thus, this should be a national priority for us, a, a high national priority. And of course, the, the problem is uh, the, the current leaders of Russia and China uh, are, are not interested in joining us on the reductions pathway. Um, one, one, might be, one might be at a certain moment, R Russia might be, um, but appears not to be at the moment. China. China is clearly headed towards some strategic posture, some nuclear posture that, it, that its president considers consistent with his vision of China being at the center of the world stage in the dominant position, quote, quote unquote. Um, arms control is simply inconsistent with that vision. Um, from my perspective, there are three essential ingredients to a future strategic arms control deal that are simply missing at the moment. Uh, the first of these, if we look back at the Cold War, when did arms control become possible? When the United States and the Soviet Union concluded that there was no longer benefit to be had in continued all-out competition. Uh, they had exhausted the perceived benefits of competition. They were gaining little except new danger through more competition uh, and, and changed course a bit. Um, it's difficult to assess that, that the, the leaders of Russia and China believe that they have gained everything they have yet to gain through competition in the, the nuclear and the other strategic domains. So the first missing ingredient is competition fatigue. Uh, the second missing ingredient in, in my experience is uh, a, a perception in Moscow and Beijing 
that we have a shared interest in assuring each other in confidence building and in strategic stability. I'm not even persuaded we have similar concepts of strategic stability anymore. And we've heard clear statements from Foreign Minister Lavrov that uh, Russia's interest in strategic stability are now, quote, peripheral in contrast to its interest in redressing its concerns about the unacceptable conditions in the European security environment. Uh, I, I'm, I'm reminded of a, one of Thomas Schelling's last pieces of writing. Uh, he wrote an introduction to a small book on strategic stability produced by the U.S. Army War College. Uh, and, and in his introduction, he said, um, um, he described the 12-year journey from American recognition of the so-called delicate balance in the nuclear relationship with the Soviet Union in 1958 to the ABM Treaty. And by that, he meant the, 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 the journey, as he described it, from uh, think, thinking that stability, stability was achieved simply through strong deterrence to, to a situation in, we, in which we needed to accept mutual vulnerability with the Soviet Union and accept that they too needed to have confidence in, secu in assured retaliation. Uh, and, and thus we came, we came to have a common understanding of our shared interest in stabilizing the deterrent relationship. Um, I was, uh, on, on my watch in the Pentagon, one of my duties was to try to persuade Russia of the benefits of confidence and security building measures on missile defense in Europe. Uh, and this was an unproductive effort. The Russians rejected all of the American proposals, and at a certain point, they rejected their own proposals. Uh, took them all off the table. And a couple of years ago, I ran into one of the diplomats, now retired, uh, who, who, had, who had been my partner in that activity, and I asked him. I said, I understand why you might have rejected American proposals, but why did you reject your own proposals? for confidence and security building. And his answer was, you Americans already have too much of both, confidence and security. And if, if, if that's your view, the second missing ingredient is a shared perception in um, mutual reassurance and in, strategic, and in the value of strategic stability, the value of, of mutual reassurance. And the third, third missing ingredient, in my view, uh, is an understanding of the new military problems in the strategic military relationships among the three, the United States, Russia, and China, for which mutual reciprocal restraint might be the solution. This strategic, these strategic military relationships are clearly multipolar in character. They, they're also multi-domain in character. Um, F Foreign Minister Lavrov has described the, the quote, new security situation, I'm sorry, new security equation in which everything is connected to everything. And, and it's, it's a fair and accurate description. Um, so I, I think there's uh, analytic work to do to, to go back to the first point. Can they work in tandem? Yes, they can when uh, parties to the deterrence relationships have, perceive, and are willing to act upon shared interests in stabilizing competition in that relationship. And I just don't see us there yet for the political and conceptual reasons that I've argued. Let me stop there. Thanks very much. Turn it over to Gaukar. Um, Gaukar, just before um, I turn it over to you, um, I just two kind of quick 
comments. So I will own that ambiguous question that was put in there. And I wish I could say that it was intentionally ambiguous and I thought it would provoke all this discussion. Um, no, I just thought it was a cool question, but I thought what Brad did with it was really interesting. And um, so I, I wanted to really thank, um, thank Brad for kind of breaking that apart. But also, Gaukar, before I turn it over to you, I really wanted to thank you for accepting this invitation because, you know, Gaukar, you obviously know the DC scene, you know NPRs, you know the NPR process, but um, how to put this, you roll in slightly different circles. Um, and you hang out with a much uh, with a wide, diverse international crowd that I think engages with arms control, non-pro, and disarmament in some in different ways than I, I think a lot of people in D.C. would uh, necessarily know. Uh, and so I, I'm just really grateful uh, that that you're here to to share your views. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Heather. And, uh, thank you for pointing out that uh, I'm one of those things that's not like the others. Uh, but, but thank you, uh, thank you very much for inviting me um, to be part of this uh, really illustrious panel. And I, uh, I'll pretend not to be intimidated, but I might not be too successful in that. Um, so, to the questions, um, I've been asked to discuss primarily how will U.S. arms control policy be perceived by perceived by deterrent skeptics and disarmament community. And before I go any further, let me just put that caveat that I don't speak for uh, a disarmament community or disarmament communities. So what will follow is just my personal interpretations and reflections on the possible reactions uh, of some of the, the groups falling under sort of broad umbrella of disarmament community and deterrence uh, skeptics to the U.S. Uh, arms control policy and, and some of the elements, possible elements of the nuclear posture review. And so to, to, to echo maybe something that Brad raised is uh, whose reactions are we really talking about? What, what is this uh, group of nuclear uh, of deterrence skeptics? Uh, and I think it is, it is indeed a more diverse group that might appear at the first uh, glance. It's, it's not a neat division into camps of Zamas, deterrents, or skeptics and deterrents. Um, and, and what I'll do is list some of the arguments that, that, that sort of speak to skepticism about nuclear deterrents without necessarily calling those uh, as discrete camps, I think groups of states and people can, can ascribe to different arguments within the spectrum. So uh, out there we have people who believe perhaps that nuclear deterrence has worked fairly well in the past, uh, especially between the United States and the Soviet Union. But in the currently changing world with the growing number of nuclear weapons possessors, with uh, the growing number of potential deterrence relationships, Nuclear deterrence is simply becoming too unstable, too risky, and, and so there's a greater likelihood of catastrophic failure, and therefore that that is the sort of motivator for a more determined pursuit of nuclear disarmament. Um, there's those uh, that think that nuclear deterrence has probably worked in the past and will probably continue to work some of the times, uh, but again, that's too much uncertainty, and, and eventually it will fail. Uh, then you might have people with more profound criticism about nuclear deterrence um, working, so to say, that that it um, that it's not really doing and hasn't done what it's purported to do, such as keeping the peace and preventing a large war between between great powers. Uh, and the overconfidence in in nuclear deterrence would lead to again catastrophic mistakes uh, sooner or later. Uh, because nuclear weapons would just continue to exist, and as, soon, as long as they exist, there is a risk of them being used for, for whatever reason. Uh, and finally, you have the group uh, loosely defined. You have the, the argument that rejects nuclear deterrence and nuclear weapons as legitimate instruments of, of security altogether um, due to the inhumane nature of the weapon itself and the catastrophic effects of, of their use. Uh, I, I suspect, Heather, you were primarily interested in me covering this, this last argument and this, this last group, uh, especially since it has grown in prominence very significantly in the past decade, uh, especially in the multilateral realm where, as you say, I, I, I swim. <laughs> and so where is this coming from? Where does it fall in the context of, of uh, sort of the non-proliferation regime? So traditionally, in the in the context of the non-proliferation treaty um, and its review process, 
uh, you usually had a, a standard kind of dividing line between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. But this is generalizing, but broadly speaking, you always could point to the treaty mandated haves and have-nots. Um, and so these agreements uh, between uh, the U.S. allies that don't have nuclear weapons and, and, and those countries uh, outside the alliances were, were sort of less pronounced, but, but you could see the, some of this global south uh, versus global north divide. Uh, and in, in this situation, you, um, you very well had uh, very active nuclear disarmament advocates, respected nuclear disarmament advocates and proponents from among the U.S. US allies. Um, the approach that dominated the nuclear disarmament discourse in this uh, in this context was the incremental one, right? The idea that you will achieve eventually nuclear disarmament uh, through uh, implementation of of different of a series of of steps, uh, practical steps, including, of course, maybe most importantly, uh, arms control, so sort of reductions of nuclear weapons, uh, bilateral. No, we haven't had any any other kind of uh, arms control, uh, but also um, multilateral prohibitions on nuclear testing, for example, and production of fissile material. A uh, bit of a problem with, with that approach was that the nuclear weapon states never really articulated how we or they get from the strategic arms control uh, to, to the total elimination of nuclear weapons. You had a bit of a gap there in, in the vision uh, of, of how we get from this, this point to, to, the, to the final one. Um, and the step-by-step -step discourse certainly did not challenge nuclear deterrence and legitimacy of nuclear weapons in the here and now. Um, tacitly, in the, in the context of the NPT review process, the nuclear deterrence came to be kind of accepted as a necessary evil. Um, and in that, uh, in that regard, whether arms control and nuclear deterrence can work in tandem, was not disputed. It was sort of a given, given reality that, that that's how that's how it, it, it operates. Um, what what got lost in in all of this, uh, and and I would recall something that Tom Nichols said on the first panel is is our perspective on the consequences of, of nuclear weapons uh, of nuclear weapons use. Um, the consideration of what happens, what might happen if nuclear weapons are used, was not very deeply discussed in in the NPT real, and that's where you you have the emergence of the humanitarian discourse since about 2010, which sought to reframe the debate um, in the multilateral sphere, but also beyond sort of the, the conference rooms, um, to shift focus from uh, discussions of strategic stability, so arms control between great powers, to the very question of the impact of nuclear weapons and what, what, what they do to people, to societies, to environment, should, should they be used, and also highlight the lack of capacity at the national or international level uh, to adequately respond to any case of use of nuclear weapons. And so that discourse developed rapidly and, and, and gained a lot of support, gained support of the majority of states parties to the NPT. Uh, it's often blamed for sort of sowing uh, disagreement. I think it didn't necessarily create new fault lines, but rather expose those that were not so evident before. And so um, the, the, the fault line that emerged fairly early uh, was the question of whether nuclear weapons can ever be used under any circumstances. And you suddenly found some of the traditional disarmament advocates unable to join that line that nuclear weapons cannot be used under any circumstances. Uh, and so instead of the traditional divide of has and ha have not, uh, we have now sort of division between those states that accept that nuclear weapons might have to be used under some circumstances. And those are uh, states uh, under extended nuclear deterrence. They don't want nuclear weapons to be used, most certainly. They still advocate for nuclear disarmament, but they're just not ready to accept this idea that there is no circumstance under which nuclear weapons can be used. And then uh, those convinced that the consequences of, of nuclear weapons use are unacceptable and make the weapons themselves illegitimate. And the question following from that latter discourse is not so much whether arms control can work with, in tandem with nuclear deterrence, but whether nuclear deterrence and disarmament are compatible, right? Can you ever reach the state of total elimination of nuclear weapons if you continue to believe uh, in the uh, legitimacy of nuclear deterrence, a policy based on a credible threat of use of nuclear weapons? And so that's kind of the this is where the i think the the most focus of deterrence skepticism lies in in the multilateral realm at least 
uh, what does it mean for the possible reactions uh, or expectations from the US arms control policy and the upcoming um, nuclear posture review? Not only the, the this last group I described, but also previous ones concerned about the possibility of nuclear deterrence failing, I think they're, they all converge on their focus on nuclear risk reduction. So there is um, the fact that people question or or try to reject the validity or the legitimacy of nuclear weapons doesn't mean that they reject all the elements of step-by-step -step approach that they outright reject the value of strategic arms control or or nuclear testing prohibition or office or material prohibition certainly not um, they just believe that there's greater urgency to move on nuclear disarmament and that the prohibition is is, is the right way um, it's, it's, not, it's not the only right way, but it's, it's kind of an, an urgency now, more so than it would be under uh, if we ascribe more to a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, but they also are concerned, first and foremost, about the reducing the likelihood of, uh, or the re reducing the risk of nuclear weapons use. And that's where I think those different groups converge in their expectation from, from the future steps. Uh, how can we effectively reduce the risk of, of nuclear weapons use? Um, as you mentioned, the information we have on the NPR so far is, is, is limited, and the fact sheet I looked at doesn't give much, but I think there's one phrase that stands out as, as key to me, and that's that the NPR underscores our commitment to reducing the rule of, role of nuclear weapons and reestablishing our leadership in arms control. And so the leadership, I think, is, is, is something that the outside actors would be very much looking to. The articulation of nuclear disarmament as a goal and an achievable goal, not, and not just kind of some kind of lofty aspiration that is far removed from current reality. Um, and, and therefore, lack of strong commitment to that goal uh, would, be, would be disappointing across, across the board. Um, the role of nuclear weapons and the reduction of the role of nuclear weapons is of particular then importance to uh, to those who, of course, question the legitimacy of nuclear of nuclear deterrence, um, and and so they'd be looking at the centrality of of nuclear weapons to the U.S. security policy. So they expect them to question how the U.S. is going to square its. Uh, commitment to nuclear disarmament with the prior, top priority of, uh, and I quote, maintaining a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent and strong and credible extended deterrence commitments. Um, and related to risk reduction, there would be questions not only about sort of the, the, the crisis communications and, and uh, enhancing stability, uh, but also questions that nuclear weapon states have traditionally found more irritating about the alert levels, for example. Um, the reducing the uh, or increasing the time it, it, it takes uh, to to make a decision and actually launch nuclear weapons. Um, modernization, I think, is something uh, very important, uh, and uh, the future shape of the U.S. arsenal. There have been proposals and discussions about possibly eliminating one of the the legs of the of the triad. Uh, if that doesn't go anywhere, if modernization plans are not uh, are not reshaped. Uh, then again, there would be uh, a question, how do you square the commitment to, to leadership on nuclear deterrence or on nuclear disarmament and arms control with a very expensive multi-year investment in, in, in nuclear weapon systems uh, across the three legs of the, of the triad. Um, so I am, I've, I've operated so far on those sort of limited uh, knowledge of what might be in the, in the, in the NPR. and. Um, I must say that that I would expect the the reaction outside reaction to to the NPR to be um, not too enthusiastic if, if some of those elements that I mentioned uh, are not reflected to um, to people's expectations. Um, I'll stop there and um, happy to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Gaukar. Um, thank you, Rose. Thank you, Brad. That was really um, rich fascinating start to our, our conversation. Uh, for those of you in the room, as a reminder, you have your little note, the note cards. Um, if you do want um, to ask a question and have your note card, make sure you raise it up high so that um, the Pony team can come get it. And online, please do submit your questions. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get us started. And I, I have a question for, uh, for each one of our three speakers. Uh, so first question uh, for Rose will be, um, the, the previous panel talked a, a bit about the NPR process some historical looks at MPRs. 
Uh, and one of the statements from the last panel was that the 2010 NPR served as a foundation and worked in tandem with New START negotiations um, and the outcome of New START. And so I was wondering if, in, you know, in your, in your role negotiating New START, if you could just reflect a little bit on that intersection of arms control in practice and the NPR. Um, for Brad, it's actually the same question, but from a DOD perspective, as you were uh, heavily involved uh, in the 2010 NPR. So uh, as you were working on the 2010 NPR, um, you know, how, to what extent were new start negotiations in mind uh, and, and how were those uh, working together? Question for Galkar. Um, I was a, I was a little bit surprised, Galkar, when you said um, when you mentioned the importance of the phrase reducing the role of nuclear weapons and seeing that in the NPR uh, or at least on, in the NPR fact sheet. And so I was wondering if you could say a bit more about how is that phrase interpreted um, by non-nuclear weapon states by the NGO community, what does it mean when the U.S. says that we plan to reduce the role of nuclear weapons um, and you brought up, you know, modernization plans and I've heard people make the argument that saying you're going to reduce the role while ambitious modernization, that those points are in tension with each other. Um, so I, I would I'd just like to hear a little bit more uh, from you about how you think the phrase reducing the role is, is interpreted. Uh, but uh, Rose, over, over to you uh, to, to start the, the first round of uh, question and answer, please. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes for a right of reply to Brad Roberts' excellent three points, but I happen to disagree uh, with two out of the three of them. And let me say why. I'm always taking a very pragmatic view uh, of uh, negotiation and, uh, and diplomacy and what can be achieved at the table. And I believe we should keep our goals uh, sharply defined and, and not discard the whole notion of achieving any goals uh, through a negotiated process because the overarching um, mood is not right. And the overarching mood right now is dreadful between Washington and Moscow. But negotiation is impossible until suddenly it is possible. And frankly, I've been very glad and will hope that we move forward to implementation. But the grain shipment deal, I think, is a good, a good example of, of that. Nobody thought anything was possible until suddenly they were able to make progress. So the reason I bring this up, your number two impediment, Brad, is the, that the perception of shared interest in mutual confidence and strategic uh, stability uh, doesn't seem to be quite there now. Well, yes, we have very sharp and nasty words from Minister Lavrov now. He seems to be rejecting all those notions, except I do believe that there's a pragmatic and a continuing pragmatic interest in mutual predictability. Not only do we want that predictability as we modernize our forces, but the Russians having pretty much completed their own nuclear modernization at this point, they need predictability about what our triad modernization is going to produce. So I will predict to this audience that even if we don't get to the new start replacement by February of 2026, that both Moscow and Washington will do what we did during the new start negotiations in December of 2009 when we said, yes, we don't have a new treaty, it's not ready yet, but nevertheless, we will keep to the limitations of the START treaty uh, for this in interregnum, for this interim period. Now, let's see. I mean, my prediction may be way wrong, and everything is going to continue going in a very negative direction in our relations. But I think that there is still an abiding interest as we accomplish nuclear modernization in keeping the other side uh, under some limitations so that we have that basic predictability against which to plan. The, and Galkar pointed to it, this plan, these very expensive and complex modernization programs. So I think that that is an abiding interest for, for both sides. On number three, uh, we um, don't really see uh, that a mutual understanding of the new problems um, 
for which mutual reassurance might be an answer. Well, here I'm very, very interested. Of course, I think that in the case of trying to demand the Chinese come to the table, for example, to negotiate on strategic arms reduction at this point, the previous administration tried that, President Trump tried that, it didn't work. The, the uh, kind of disbalance in the size of the force structures is, is too great. But here, I think we look for areas where there is some equality of capability between uh, the Chinese and the United States and also between the United States and, and Russia. And I was quite interested when Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin met at the beginning of the Beijing Olympics on, on February 4th and their massive 6,000 word statement concentrated on, you know, uh, undying friendship for all time with no limits. And, and that's what everybody's pointed to. But there was a paragraph there that talked about beginning discussions of moratoria on intermediate range ground launched missile systems in Asia and in Europe. And here's an area where there is some equality of capability on the Chinese side. So again, it's a pragmatic and, and very narrow kind of potential here. It's not that suddenly we and the Chinese embrace each other as of one mind in regard to strategic stability, but that there could be some limited uh, and more focused uh, goals and objectives where we have some equality of capability. And we've already, the first signal that I've seen from Xi Jinping that he's at all interested in anything to do with negotiated restraint in this in this realm. So I would just say, and, and welcome further debate when you get your chance at the floor, but, uh, but here I see, I wouldn't necessarily except that your impediments are the barriers that, that you see them as. On your question, uh, uh, I think it's really interesting um, that in the New START negotiations, um, we did have certain requirements that were uh, hinged on the NPR and they related to how low we could go and what were going to be the reductions that we were willing to put forward uh, in the new start context, both limitations on delivery vehicles and launchers and also on deployed warheads. So we did have some kind of um, necessity of that further process, but in the end of the day, it did not get caught up in the NPR because the NPR was a lengthier process and we were under a very accelerated timeline for new start negotiations with a demand, if you may recollect, that we actually finish the negotiations by December of 2009, and it, it didn't happen, but we really needed to work fast together with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, together with, uh, with uh, of course, the entire military establishment to figure out what we'd be willing to put on the table for further reduction. So that was a process that, that went forward, uh, working together with, uh, with the White House and the interagency very, rather early in the negotiations uh, in the period between uh, when we started in the summer of, of 2009 and uh, then into the into the fall period. I would say, and, and Brad, I'll be very interested in your comments on this as well, because you were right in the middle of it back in Washington, but I would say that the biggest interplay uh, for the 2010 NPR was not with the New START negotiations, but with uh, the President's Prague speech in 2010 and the kind of objectives he had, he had laid out there, uh, which to my mind was a more kind of um, a large scale driver of, of the thinking and, and the uh, activity in, in the NPR. In some ways, New START was on a continuum with the START Treaty, and we used the START Treaty and its structure. What we had to decide was how further, how far further were we willing to reduce. But otherwise, it was the Prague speech that, that was the uh, inherent uh, inter. Um, interrelated driver of the NPR rather than New START per se. That would be my view of that of that question. Thanks. Brad, over to you. Thanks. Well lots of lots of good things to discuss and my my um my my shorthand in composing my notes for for one, the, the second second question was that Rose would describe the glass as half full and I would describe it as half empty. And, and we've done that, and that's, uh, I don't think we actually see the real opportunities and constraints all that differently, uh, which is to say, I, I, I think there are opportunities, um, and, and I hope the moment comes that, that um, uh, when there's a political will uh, to, to come to some point of compromise on some of these points, uh, 
I am skeptical, uh, and I brought that brought that brought that out. I'm skeptical on, on two points. One, uh, she may be interested in arms control in Asia. We've done a very good job of explaining to him why China's arms control restraint is in our interest. We haven't made very compelling cases about why restraint is in China's interest to China. Uh, and um, secondly, I hope that Russia still prizes legal restraints on American strategic potential in the way it has for a long time. But from a technical perspective, uh, Russia has the ability to continue to grow its force if it chooses to do so, uh, because it's, at, as you observed, at the end of its modernization cycle, it could choose to continue to keep the lines open, and it's created the potential to upload significant numbers of warheads if it wanted to do so. And in converse, uh, the United States uh, is 15, 18 years away from being able to add additional capability if it wanted to do so, because for this period of modernization, it will only be replacing existing capabilities with um, weapons, with capabilities that, that, that uh, aren't, aren't, aren't aging out. So I see a shift in the relative capacity of the United States and Russia to compete in an unconstrained environment and I think historically that Russia perceived a disadvantage in that that is no longer a disadvantage. May not be an advantage either. Um, uh, to Heather, to your, your question, uh, um, essentially chapter one of the 2009 review process was about New START. Um, the, f the first task of, of the review process was to establish negotiating objectives for the, for the negotiations uh, under different assumptions about, um, um, well, uh, uh, with the understanding that there would be no change to presidential employment guidance before the Senate had the opportunity to offer its advice and consent to any agreement that might be struck with Moscow. So the, the, one of the consequences of prioritizing uh, an arms control objective as the first step of the NPR, one of the consequences was that the Obama administration was very long delayed in implementing its, the results of its review in the form of reformed planning guidance, the so-called 90-day study that took 490 days. Uh, um, but once we had uh, the negotiating objectives set, uh, then, then we proceeded, then, then the rest of the NPR proceeded, um, not with the assumption that the negotiation would be successful, but we understood the clear difference between success and failure of the negotiation in terms of its re implications for um, the required forces for the United States. There's more to say, but in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Thank you. Gaukar, the question on uh, the phrase and language of reducing the role. Thanks. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so I think the, the focus on the reduction of the role of nuclear weapons, and it has, it has a history in the, in the NPT context from so at least the 2000 uh, final documents that there's been expectation and uh, insistence on, on reducing the role of nuclear weapons um, in security policies. And I think it goes to the idea and question that if you see something as fundamental and absolutely central to guaranteeing your security, or to use French language to guarantee your sovereignty, even uh, then how can you how how are you making plans for eliminating that? So how, that's that. So we we would like to see if if we are talking about sort of gradual uh, progress to nuclear exam, how do you get to that point where nuclear weapons are not important not important enough that you can eliminate them? And so that I think that's kind of the idea behind looking at the role of nuclear weapons. Uh, 
more practically, what does it mean? It's looking at, at limiting the potential scenarios or circumstances under which the U.S. would or other nuclear states would consider using nuclear weapons. And that's, uh, uh, I think, the, the, the latest debates have been around sole purpose, uh, whether or not the U.S. Uh, would or can or wish to move to sole purpose. And, and President Biden expressed, uh, during, broadly speaking, his um, conviction that the U.S. should move in that direction. But um, President Obama considered that as well, or no first use policy, also a very popular uh, formulation. Um, and, and then largely due to objections from, from allies as well. Uh, that, that was not achieved under the Obama administration. It seems that that's not going to be the case in the in the Biden NPR NPR as well, but when when states um, uh, and uh, I guess NGO groups uh, experts talk about the reduction of the role of nuclear weapons in national security policy, these are the kinds of things they're looking at: um, limiting conditions and scenarios in which nuclear weapons might be considered um, for use. Um, and then, uh, the, speaking of allies, that's also the the role of nuclear weapons in defending your allies. If again new extended nuclear deterrence is is central to your uh, commitment to allies, then it's not likely you'd be moving close, quickly towards nuclear disarmament. So again, that's one of the and the yardsticks I think the uh, outside actors use looking at um, when they look for signs of greater sort of commitment to nuclear disarmament in policy papers. And also something that you discussed earlier, and I caught on a little bit of it, but it's the, the question of integrated deterrence. Uh, I can reasonably guarantee there's nobody discussing integrated deterrence <laughs> in the circles where, I'm, uh, where I usually am. But if that were to become the central element of the new NPR, if that's something presented as this, this, is, this is it, um, then yes, expect questions uh, about whether this is just smoke and mirrors and a new, a new dressing for, for essentially the same policy you've ever had. Or does it presuppose uh, a reduction in the role of nuclear weapons because you potentially are looking at more mission at, uh, uh, at more missions being uh, covered by other type uh, other systems and ty other types of weapons? That's that's all I think from me for now. Thank you, Gaukar. That last comment I think was um, particularly valuable. I saw quite a few eyes in the room get a little bit wider when you said that. Uh, so that, that was really helpful. Um, so I'm going to do another round of questions. Um, we have a lot of questions this round, which is really great. I'm going to keep doing separate questions for each of you to try to get in as many as possible, but you should feel free to comment on any of the questions that, that you hear. Um, so I'm going to go in reverse order this time. So Gaukar, for you, um, one of the questions that came in was asking you to weight those that spectrum of deterrence skeptics. I think you, you had a couple categories there. And so the question is, are those who object the loudest the most influential, influential in multilateral forums? Uh, so the, those different types of um, deterrent skeptics, who, who has uh, the loudest voice, who has the most influential voice. Uh, question for Brad, um, though I suspect Rose might also want to weigh in on this, um, and it's about, um, says there seems to be a consensus that the next arms control treaty with Russia will need to involve both strategic and non-strategic or exotic nuclear weapons. How does the U.S. get Russia to engage on non-strategic nuclear weapons? Um, what I think is the really interesting part of this question, what leverage do we, the United States, have and what can we offer um, in such a negotiation? Um, and then question uh, for Rose, uh, again, a lot of folks wondering if and how do we restart arms control? Uh, and this one is, how do we restart arms control dialogues with Russia after Ukraine? Uh, can you engage in confidence building risk reduction measures when there is no trust between the negotiating partners? Um, and so, I'm, I, as I said, I'm going to do this one in reverse. Uh, so, Gaukar, over to you in terms of the, the weighting of the deterrent skeptics' views. Um, thank you. That's, that's a difficult question. I'm, I'm... As I said, it's, it's, these are not discrete camps necessarily. These are the kinds of arguments um, that um, express, that exist out there exp expressing uh, skepticism about deterrence. And so I think there is um, a hybrid sort of between states or, or an, an experts, individuals who, who think that nuclear deterrence might have worked, 
under some circumstances. Maybe it kept the peace during the Cold War. We can't prove definitively one way or another that it was that was that was it, right? So we have this uncertainty inherent in in, in nuclear deterrence, and then weigh that versus the risks um, versus the consequences should nuclear deterrence fail. And so they come heavy on the side of those risks. Those consequences are unacceptable, and and therefore they 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 reject nuclear, you know, the sort of the perpetuation of, of nuclear deterrence. A, it might have worked. It might have not worked. And and the cost of us getting it wrong is is very high. And so that's enough ground to uh, to pursue the the prohibition of of nuclear weapons. And I think that convergence is is, is where the you know the the importance. The importance truly, it truly lies. Um, I hesitate to define who's sort of the loudest and who, who's the more, more, um, more influential. You have countries that would criticize sort of any step that's short of uh, disarmament and short of uh, putting a time timeline and a deadline on on nuclear disarmament in the APT context. And they, it, it might come out of deep conviction or it might come out of being in political ideological confrontation with um, the West, let's say, uh, one way or another. Yeah, you have some of those voices who um, who are loud but not influential necessarily. Uh, and then you have states that express that are more, more circumspect in their, in their expressions, uh, but they are the ones that, that can move things. And, and so if you look at the um, the leaders in the humanitarian initiative, the leaders in negotiating the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, it's also the countries that have been constructively active in the NPT, uh, you know, thing, countries like like Ireland, for example. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if it's a, if it's a um, satisfactory answer, but I would just differentiate between saying that somebody who's loudest is, is most influential, that, that, is, that is not the case. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Brad, over to you. Well, the American ambition to use arms control to deal with the nuclear imbalance of, in Europe is decades old. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't certainly through oversight or uh, lack of interest that, that the Obama administration didn't end up with some deal on this topic we, we would like to have, but it was simply outside the realm of the, the possible then. Uh, and I don't think it's become more, more, more plausible in the interim. Uh, you, know, you all, I presume, know Russia's starting point for this discussion, which is we can start a discussion about uh, uh, a non-nuclear Europe as soon as America takes its nuclear weapons home. Uh, and, and then Russia might be prepared to make some changes to its its posture. Um, it's also made clear in its um, the diplomacy over the draft treaties that were offered in December uh, that there's no that there's no uh, a la carte approach to the European security order uh, as as we might hope. We 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 would like to seize what opportunities there are, uh, take building blocks where we can. Uh, and puts put a stronger foundation under the European security order than, than now exists. And we'd like arms control to be a central part of that. Um, but uh, Russia's statement of, I think it's eight conditions in the European security environment that are unacceptable, uh, came in, in February with a clear statement that, that the American hope of doing something a la carte um, instead of do, dealing with all eight uh, was um, not not well founded. That Russia was wasn't prepared to join us in that process. Now it might at some point in the future, uh, and w we can hope, if that's the right word, that the outcome in Ukraine is such that Russia feels um, open to the possibility of some forces disposition of forces agreement as part of an arms armistice or a peace settlement uh, that provides for some new agreement in this area. Um, let me stop there. Rose, thoughts? 
Yeah, well, I go back to my previous uh, my previous comment that the conditions stop action until all of a sudden the conditions get dropped. So, um, of course, the administration was hoping in January by making very clear, and we've made very, very clear to the Russians that their conditions that they piled up on the table in December, November and December with their ridiculous uh, draft European security agreements that they were unacceptable for us. NATO was never going to move back to its 1997 borders. In fact, what the Russians have gotten now is more NATO in Europe with uh, with Finland and Sweden joining NATO. So, um, and and the demand that, that uh, the United States and NATO alliance say that the door was closed to further NATO enlargement, including to Ukraine, that was just not gonna happen. I think it still will not happen. And so we have made clear that some of those demands are just unacceptable to us. So if the Russians uh, are willing uh, to come back to the table, it will be on the basis that we are not going to we are not going to negotiate over those those demands. But I do take heart, frankly, uh, from the way that uh, the Trump administration, President Trump himself, got President Putin to agree to a freeze on all warheads, strategic and non-strategic, deployed and non-deployed. This, to my mind, was an important first step in any effort to negotiate warhead constraints in the uh, next negotiation. The Russians have now said that that precedent is off the table. It was something Foreign Minister Rubkov did back in February before the invasion, but shortly before the invasion. Nevertheless, they did take it seriously. They understand what the ask is from the United States perspective, strategic and non-strategic, deployed and non-deployed. And that package of a freeze on all warheads, I think, could be brought to the negotiating table as a kind of first step to be transformed into a limit, a negotiated limit, through the inclusion of monitoring and verification measures. Um, but then the question is, what's the, what's the interest of the Russians in taking that deal? And in my view, the trade space is within the total warhead freeze. So we want constraints on Russian non-strategic nuclear weapons. They are concerned, Brad, just as we are concerned about Russian upload capacity, and I agree with everything you said about their industrial capacity, that they have the hot production lines now for both missiles and warheads, and we don't. But nevertheless, they are concerned about upload capacity on our SLICMs and our ICBMs, particularly as we modernize. And so I think that they are keen to get constraints on warheads designated for uh, strategic delivery vehicles. And so that trade space, I think, is in that total, that total uh, warhead limit as the uh, moratorium would be transformed into. Uh, so that's my, my view on that question. Um, yeah, the question about how to restart after Ukraine when there's no trust between the parties, that's absolutely right. But here again, I return to the point I made about starting uh, small and starting pragmatic. Already there are talks underway now about uh, issues to do with new start implementation and in particular how to restore on-site inspection after the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, they've been um, suspended for two years because of the pandemic. So there are technical talks going on now about how to resume on-site inspection. Furthermore, the Russians and the United States have continued to uh, implement aspects of the new start verification regime, which include the exchange of regular notifications about the movements of our strategic delivery vehicles and launchers. And the Russians have been very good about notifying uh, the movements of their, uh, of their delivery vehicles and launchers during this period. Again, there's good communication regularly taking place between the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center at the MOD in Moscow and the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center at the State Department in Washington. So we use those pragmatic technical links to get some interchange going. And perhaps in the first instance, it is risk reduction, just as the questioner uh, laid out, but uh, certainly to use the technical platforms that we have and the technical connections that we have between experts and negotiators on the inside of government to slowly build up, as I put it earlier, uh, a, a 
um, discussion that could lead to consideration of a framework uh, for new start follow up. Again, I really believe it's going to have to happen. It's very unusual. And I wrote in my book about how valuable it was from the outset to have the support of President Obama and President Medvedev. Remember when he was president? Have the support of those two presidents from the outset to lend authority to our negotiations. So it's trickier, it's chancier to start at the technical level. But of course, they would have to be proceeding under the author, uh, authorization and, and instructions of their two governments. So in that context, perhaps we can begin to make some, uh, some progress. But that, that is why I say we have to build on what's going on now, which is very much related to New START implementation, but do it uh, in a way that is, is very much a technical conversation to begin with. Uh, thank you. Um, so I have a question now for Rose and Gaukar, um, I think. So Rose, this, this follows perfectly from your last point um, where, you know, about the importance of leaders, government channels in risk reduction. Um, but th this question is, um, what role can civil society play in future risk reduction and arms control efforts? Uh, should civil society play a role at all? Um, I'm, our, I'm guessing both of you will say yes. Um, but uh, if I could, I'd, I'd like to start with Rose, just because, uh, you know, Rose, when you were in, in government, this was something I, I always saw you as a real leader on um, in engaging, particularly with next generation uh, civil society folks. And so if you could just say a bit about the role for civil society and risk reduction and arms control, please. I am a big believer in the role of civil society. I think at this moment that there is a special role that uh, civil society may be able to play, including younger experts, such as those who are present in the, in the pony uh, process. Um, the only, really the only game in town right now is track two, and track two with the Russians is very, very difficult. I recognize that because of the way the, the foreign agent law has become uh, more and more egregious over time, so that even communicating now with foreigners and being seen as being influenced by foreigners can lead to the FSB knocking on your door. So it's a very, very troubled period for our uh, Russian uh, counterparts as they have, as, as they're trying to navigate this this uh, really terrible environment in Russia for, for some form of discourse, dialogue and cooperation. But I think if they are allowed to participate in track two uh, activities, they will do so you know, with permission and that we should do our best uh, to continue then to take those signals of readiness for discussion and, and be ready to reach out to them. I continue to be involved in the Committee on International Security and Arms Control of the National Academy of Sciences. We continue to have discussions with our Russian Academy of Sciences counterparts. There are some younger people involved in that group, many of whom, you know, people in the audience here and, and Brad and, and Gaukar and you, Heather, know. I think we need to we need to take the signals from them as to what they can do right now. But we should be ready to engage and do what we can to advance uh, a, a useful discourse at this moment and one that will, I hope, lead to further risk reduction and, and threat reduction in the first instance, but then also perhaps lay the groundwork for some government to government negotiations going forward. Again, my first priority is to start the process to put in place a framework for new start follow on negotiations. But there could be a wider agenda here, including on uh, some means and methods for restoring the European security architecture, which is also, well, it's frankly been destroyed uh, in recent years with, I think, this current war being practically the death blow. So so I would just encourage people to be thinking about how to to reach out and resume. Gavkar, I'll be interested in your answer on this as to whether there's some special role that Russia's neighbors in the region can play in this. For example, uh, Kazakhstani experts interacting with, with Russian counterparts. So I'll, I'll be interested in, in if you think there's any special role for, uh, for more, uh, more in the neighborhood to play here, but over to you. Yeah, Gaukar, please. Thank you. Um, I'll punt on the neighborhood for, for the moment and, and just say that civil society is also not a, a homogenous group and, and there are different roles that different kinds of society can can play. There's of course the, the our primarily our world think tanks, academia, and uh, it is 
their duty basically to to provide honest analysis and and, and recommendations call out um what they see as wrong provide their expert input um di directly to to governments but also to to the broader audience uh, and i think it, uh, it's very important to to help keep the broader public informed and interested uh, because then that feeds into the public being able to question um, the nuclear weapons policy of of their government uh, and and um, and then that that sort of builds builds influence uh, it's not a, an easy process not a yeah, direct process but it's i think it's important it's complacency in in raising awareness and emphasizing the importance of these issues for the audience i think it carries in and of itself risks um, and then you have the the activist civil society and they have been already instrumental in advancing for example the humanitarian initiative um, they have directly lobbied uh, parliamentarians, you know, uh, city governments, and, and so they already have played a significant role in, in, in drawing the attention of politicians to this issue, you know, sort of forcing the hand of, of some governments. A uh, very interesting initiative um, that's working is the Don't Bank on the Bomb and influencing financial institutions uh, to, to divest from uh, companies that are connected somehow to nuclear weapons production so so there there is a spectrum of things that that civil society groups of civil society uh, can do uh, but i would echo what was said about the importance of dialogue between uh, academia and, and, and experts uh, in in different countries us us and russia um, i i don't i actually don't know what exactly um the neighborhood can do with regard to to communicating with Russia, or we, we can't really serve as the proxies, but we, but the, the um, academia and experts uh, from Russia's neighborhood, so to say, could perhaps provide better understanding of Russia because of closer communication, you know, except the countries that are uh, that are in more hostile relationship with, with it. So, so experts based in Kazakhstan could have a better understanding of, of the views within within Russia and help help convey that understanding in the lack of direct conflict contact between Western and Russian um, academia and, and, and experts. Thank you. Final question, slightly rapid fire. Same question for all three of you. Um, and this time I'll, um, I think I'll start with Brad and then go to Galkar and then, and then end with Rose. And so the, the way the question came in was, um, is arms control realistic in the current environment with three major nuclear powers? I'm gonna slightly reinterpret it and ask you to instead try to make some predictions and say, how likely do you think trilateral arms control is between US, Russia, China by the year 2030? I'm sorry to go to you first, Brad. That wasn't very fair. But uh, Brad, over to you. You're still muted, I think. So, <laughs> trying to get out of answer, and no, I'm joking. Sorry. Uh, formal arms control in the way of a, a negotiated mechanism with um, ratified and by the Congress and being implemented involving the three, I'd say, um, very highly unlikely. Uh, informal forms of new forms of informal restraint exercised unilaterally, bilaterally, um, plausible. Uh, a bilateral deal between Russia and the United States to extend certain provisions of New START, perhaps not numerical limitations, but the transparency and predictability benefits. Um, I'd say um, a chance of one in three. Thank you. Galkar. There are too many variables for me to make an off the cuff prediction, I, I, I would say. So this, there's the current war and, and how it ends. It, it, does it end definitively as a defeated side, or it um, sort of becomes kind of a semi-frozen conflict? I think that would affect the, the, the relationship. Um, how 
how U.S. domestic politics develop and if we have the return of the kind of uh, administrations that um, either don't believe in arms control or believe in sort of trying to impose their conditions, that, that would also affect how how this might this might develop, right? So um, I think if if there is a move towards integrated, so to say, arms control, incorporating more issues into into the otherwise strategic uh, a standard strategic arms control menu, I think then then we could have a, a sort of trilateral conversation and dialogue going on uh, on issues beyond strictly speaking, you know, nuclear strategic nuclear weapons launch uh, delivery vehicles. Um, Probably not not a treaty, but uh, sort of best case scenario, we have a, a substantive dialogue on on issues uh, sort of across the, the <clears throat> across the security spectrum uh, between Russia, China, and the United States, or maybe even more likely, U.S. Russia and U.S. China. Thank you, and uh, Rose, you get the last word on this panel. All right. Well, let me, uh, before I, I do answer the question, Heather, just thank you to you and to the whole uh, Pony organization and all your participants. It's really great to have this opportunity uh, to talk to you today, uh, even from afar. Um, actually, here is one case, Brad, where I really do agree with you. I think that there, there can be a variety of uh, arrangements uh, by 2030. And we may surprise ourselves in terms of uh, what kinds of um, uh, mutual risk reduction measures we can come up with, what kinds of um, mutual uh, predictability measures we can come up with. You know, I, I, many of you know for many years I've talked about how the P5 by fits and by starts has developed uh, some mutual dialogue on strategic stability, has taken steps to develop some of the basic building blocks of a, of a treaty regime, such as uh, agreed definitions of nuclear terms. So I think there is already a, a tiny bit of a foundation can be built on, uh, certainly among Russia, China, and the United States, and leave us not forget the uh, UK and France. So I don't know if it's possible. We'll see the NPT review conferences coming month, I think will lend uh, some evidence as to, to whether or not the P5 will be a going concern over the next uh, uh, years up to 2030. So, so let's keep a sharp eye on that one. I do think I'm more optimistic, as I said, about areas where there is some equality of capability. And I want to point again to the fact that the Chinese leader has pointed to an interest in a moratorium on intermediate range ground launch missiles in Europe. We need to explore what that's all about. Maybe it's nothing, maybe it's nothing but propaganda, but we do need to explore whether there is a there there and something we can build on. I could see by 2030 having a restoration of some constraints on intermediate range ground launch missiles into moratoria, one in Asia and one in Europe. Uh, and those could be two like parallel arrangements, but I would say, frankly, the Chinese are going to want limits on the Russian INF in Asia. The 9M729 is deployed uh, within range of China, so I can I can see that the Russians, in the end of the day, will want to see that as I mean, the Chinese will want to see that as uh, a measure that applies to the Russians, and the Russians as a measure that applies to the Chinese. But but we'll see. At the moment, it doesn't look too hopeful because the over the overarching environment is so terrible, both between Moscow and Washington, and Washington and, and Beijing. But but uh, 2030s seems like an eon away at this point. But uh, the last thing I will say is that uh, I do hope uh, we can be trying to do our best to think um, in imaginative ways about, about how to move forward on issues that are very much of concern to us. And again, there are other areas where China has some equality of capabilities, such as in uh, space assets, and also in hypersonic glide or hypersonic vehicles. And if we can figure out ways to get into discussions with the Chinese on those kinds of systems, uh, we may begin to see a pathway forward to placing some negotiated uh, constraints, negotiated restraints on, on systems of that kind as well. So I will end by saying, um, let's try to have as uh, pragmatic and proactive in as, an agenda as we can, even uh, in this darkest of environments. So thanks again, Heather, back over to you. 
Thank you, Rose. I knew you would end with a practical and optimistic note, which is exactly where we wanted to be. Um, so um, everyone online and uh, in the room, please join me in thanking um, our really wonderful panelists. So that includes, or includes, concludes uh, our our event on the uh, nuclear posture in review. Um, I am not going to try to summarize everything we heard today, but there were, was one big takeaway that I did kind of just want to pass on, which is from you know obviously the document has not been publicly released. I picked up a couple things today that for me are going to be kind of be like a template for what to look for. So when the NPR is publicly released, for me at least, the three biggest things I'm going to look for, number one is continuity. Uh, the second panel, I think, really emphasized this point that even though it's very different administrations, and I was kind of reflecting on the different NPRs, is like it really is more continuity than change. So how is the 2022 NPR going to fall into that? And the second one is on the messaging to allies. Uh, and I think the first panel and the second really capture the complexity of that, allies in Asia, allies in Europe, uh, and really tailoring not just capabilities but also messaging to all of them. The NPR is a really loud signal for the United States to send to its allies. So what is that signal saying? And then the final one comes from this last panel, and that is about how arms control is going to be portrayed. Is the United States going to be offering a vision for the future of arms control? Or more importantly, is the United States going to be showing leadership on arms control? Uh, all three of our last speakers, that was a really big takeaway for me, was the importance of leadership on arms control and saying arms control and deterrence can work in tandem with each other. So again, those are the three big things, continuity, messaging to allies, and leadership in arms control. Um, so just uh, to really wrap up now, um, I, I, do have to, I do have to and want to um, make a few thank yous. Um, first is just big thank you to Pony Sponsors for continuing to support this amazing program that, that I have loved and been a part of for years. Um, and now just, I'm just so delighted to officially be a part of. Um, in particular, I really want to thank our sponsors for this event at Northrop um, for working with us to develop the idea of an event on a document that nobody could read. Um, and thinking a bit creatively and imaginatively about how um, we wanted to go about this. It, it was a, a real treat um, to, to kind of have that intellectual space to do that. Um, I really also want to thank um, the people you may probably haven't seen, but the CSIS AV team um, who is in the back corner. Um, this was a truly hybrid event, as you saw, and it's still, I think, everyone's still finding their way and being in person and being able to zoom in people from Vienna and the West Coast. And so thank you um, so much to them uh, and to the Pony team. Uh, who are all very neatly lined up in the back. Uh, Raja, Joseph, Susie, uh, and Jess, and Kelsey, I think, is around back there uh, somewhere as well uh, for getting everybody together and for making everything run so smoothly. And then lastly, thank you to all of you, all of you online, all of you here in the room, for making this such a rich discussion, for being really active participants, uh, and for also just making it a much richer conversation. I think everyone, at least I know I really did learn a lot and take it away from today. So um, thank you all so much. And that concludes the day. Oh, and also thank you for spending a Friday in July with us. That was really <laughs> not a small ask, but thank you very much for doing that and showing up. Uh, and with that, we are all done. But thank you all again so much.